The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles, they're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. Volkswagen, Fiat, Mitsubishi, they're all household names now, but they made those names as war factories. Gotta get back to work. Sunday, the 7th of December, 1941. 353 Japanese aircraft sweep low over the Hawaiian island of Oahu and attack the US naval base at Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is infamous. It's, of course, that great defining act that drags the United States into the Second World War. Spearheading the assault is a revolutionary new kind of fighter, the A6M Zero. The Japanese in 1941 have what is, without a doubt, the world's finest fighter airplane in the form of the A6 Mitsubishi Zero. The Mitsubishi Zero was the key Japanese naval air force fighter of World War II. It was what protected the Japanese dive bombers, the Japanese torpedo bombers, in that infamous attack on the 7th of December 1941. The Americans were so surprised by the Zero that at first they didn't think that it was a Japanese aircraft. They couldn't believe that the Japanese could produce something of such intense quality. Manufactured by Mitsubishi, the story of the Zero would mirror the story of Japan's fortunes before, during, and after World War II. It is a story of triumph against the odds, of innovation dragged down by reality, and of military inventiveness transformed into peacetime genius. But it is also a story about factories. How factories, or the lack of them, would win and lose a war. At Pearl Harbor, 352 American planes were damaged or destroyed, most of them on the ground. By comparison, only two Japanese Zeros were shot down by American aircraft. The first Zero that shot down is actually a mistake. You've got Lieutenant Philip Rasmussen test firing the guns of his plane after takeoff. Opens the gun sight, boom. A zero flies in front of him and takes the full force of these guns. Now, that's the first ever zero to be shot down by an American pilot, and it was a complete fluke. Labeled the A6M by the Japanese, the zero was made by the Mitsubishi Corporation. And before the war, Mitsubishi had a hand in all aspects of Japanese society. Japanese corporate society is organized in a very different way to any other capitalist economy. There are two aspects to this. The first is the existence of large networks of firms. In the pre-war period, these are the famous zaibatsu. Zaibatsus are basically the corporations that do everything. This means you have a kind of coordination between banks, manufacturing, suppliers, retailers that you don't find in other economies. And they work very closely with the Japanese government. This reflects a kind of social cohesiveness and, if you like, collectivism that you don't find in other capitalist economies. It's a very distinctively Japanese phenomenon. So if you're the Japanese army and the navy, or indeed the Japanese government, saibatsu are useful but also to be watched. During the 1920s, Mitsubishi was one of four massive zaibatsu that dominated Japanese society. But their dominance was about to be challenged. 
you've got this situation during the 1920s and the 1930s that Japan was to all intents and purposes taken over by this warmongering clique of the Japanese army based in Manchuria. By 1937, when Japan officially declared war on China, the Japanese military were in complete control, not only of Japanese politics, but of her factories as well. The Japanese military begins to dictate what private manufacturing interests are producing. The system works like this. The military will decide that they need, let us say, a fighter plane with certain specifications. It has to be able to fly a certain speed, has to be able to carry a certain payload, uh, has to be able to resist certain kinds of fire. What you then do is go to maybe five or six companies and say, can you design a plane that will meet these specific specifications? The companies then go away and design and probably test fly a plane that will meet those specifications. The pros of this method, if you are a military person, is that you, know, you will get the aircraft that at least fulfills the needs that you want. They weren't producing things in the dark. What they produced, certainly for the early years of the war, was exactly what the Japanese military wanted. In October 1937, this is exactly what seemed to happen when the Japanese Imperial Navy submitted the specifications for a new carrier-based fighter, designated the 12 Shi, to the leading aircraft manufacturers of the time, including Mitsubishi and Nakajima Corp. Nakajima take one look at the specs and they say, that's absolutely impossible. Uh, and they just, they just get out of there. They withdraw from the competition. It's Mitsubishi that says, OK, we'll take up the challenge. Because Mitsubishi had an ace up their sleeve. A brilliant young graduate from the University of Tokyo's aviation laboratory called Yuro Horikoshi. His ability to build aircraft was identified by senior management at Mitsubishi. He sent overseas, he learns, he watches, and he, he comes back to Japan willing to take risks. Horikoshi himself actually recalls that he thought that Mitsubishi chose him because basically he was young and inexperienced and therefore he wasn't going to be bound by convention and that he didn't actually know what was impossible. His vision when it came to building aircraft was, was outstanding. There was probably no one in Japan that came close to having that same kind of visionary approach to building aircraft, particularly fighters. And that's just what Japan needs if you're going to build something like the Zero. Because the Navy's requirements for the A6 Mitsubishi Zero were extremely demanding. It's almost as if someone in the Navy sat down and said, what is the most impossible airplane we can ask for? Yeah, let's go and ask for that. But I think the Japanese Navy were pretty clever. They could see that they were going to have to fight a Pacific War. You're looking at combat over the Pacific, primarily against American or British warships, and you're probably not going to have the numbers. You're not going to outproduce the Americans or the British. So the Japanese whole philosophy in the interwar period is to prepare for war not by overwhelming in numbers, but by having the best. And so what they say is, OK, what would be the best fighter possible in their aircraft? It is very much the military sort of saying, OK, this is what we want, see if you can do it. So when he was faced with this seemingly ridiculous list of requirements from the Japanese Navy, what Horikoshi does is just throws out the rule book. One good example is the way he cut down the weight of the plane to boost its range and maneuverability. Weight for an aircraft is a killer. It makes it more difficult to get off the ground, and it means it flies slower. One problem is purely the idea of how the aircraft is built. This American Grumman Wildcat is made in three sections. Fuselage, two wings. And the wings are held on the fuselage by bolts with big nuts. They're heavy, they're steel, they add weight to the airframe. The Japanese engineer, Horikoshi, looked at the problem and thought there was a way around it. The Zero was made effectively in one piece, no bolts holding the wings on. It's also got holes wherever there can be holes, which don't affect the rigidity of the aircraft, and it's made of a new material, which is actually lighter than aluminium and not available to the Americans till the end of the war. 
This means that the Zero is faster, lighter, and more agile than anything the Americans had at the time. Duralumin was seen as a new type of metal. It was an aluminium alloy, effectively, a lighter version of aluminium than other manufacturers were using. Other manufacturers didn't see it as being strong enough to put into aircraft. Mitsubishi were almost a decade ahead of the Americans in its use there. The result was a plane like nothing anyone had seen before. The Japanese Zero is a low-wing monoplane that's equipped with a powerful radial engine. It effectively is a flying fuel tank. It's got the fuel capacity to fly over 1,100 miles, that's about 1,800 kilometers, without the use of extra drop tanks. A range almost three times greater than a Spitfire. And once you've used a good percentage of that fuel, that aircraft becomes very, very maneuverable. The aircraft has one of the finest wings that was designed up to that point, having magnificent handling characteristics in the air. In fact, all the way through to the end of the war, basically no other aircraft can turn with a Japanese Zero. It's also equipped with two 7.7 millimeter machine guns mounted in the engine nacelle firing through the prop arc, and then two powerful 20 millimeter cannons mounted in the wings. They packed a punch. They really did, and their weapons worked very well. They were very effective. There was no gun stoppages. They were reliable weapons. So it's setting this impressive standard in terms of performance in the air, maneuverability, and then the ability to lay down some pain through the use of machine guns, cannons, and you can even equip the Mitsubishi Zero with a bomb. Yet designing the impossible has its drawbacks, as early test flights of the Zero would show. Flutter is what you get when you put something like this piece of paper in an airflow. Now, for an aircraft flying at slow speed, not a problem. It just simply flies along. But if you actually get it into a flow like this, it will flutter and eventually fold up. If that was an aircraft wing, that's the end of the aircraft. So what the Japanese did is they brought in an engineer and said, how do we solve this problem? And he came up with what's known as the elevator mass balance. Basically, their weights, in this case, paper clips, on the trailing edge of the wing. This means now we've actually got weight to deal with the onset of the flutter. It's now much more rigid. The aircraft can go into a dive and it doesn't break up. It worked very effectively to the degree that they didn't suffer from these flutter problems going forward. And it was never an issue with the Zero again. The Zero is not only the best naval aircraft, it's actually one of the best fighters in the world. And it would not take long before the Zero would prove its worth in combat over China. Nineteenth of August, 1940. Twelve Mitsubishi Zeros, led by Lieutenant Tamotsu Yokoyama, lead a formation of bombers to rain down hell on the Chinese city of Chongqing. Now, this is the very first combat mission flown by the Zero over China. And you know what? Nothing happens. Chinese, they simply stayed away. And the same thing happens the next day and the next. For a month, the Japanese went up, searched the skies of China looking for Chinese fighters, and the Chinese very wisely decided they weren't going to have any of that, and they kept their aircraft on the ground. I mean, the Chinese are very sensible in their reaction. They can't fight with it, so they avoid it wherever possible. The luck of the Chinese ran out on the 13th of September, 1940 when a squadron of 13 Zeros ambushed a Chinese squadron more than twice their size. Japanese accounts claim that every single Chinese aircraft involved was shot down. It was certainly a, a large enough number to prove that the Zero was the right aeroplane to do that job. No Zeros were even damaged, let alone shot down. It was the start of a predictably painful pattern for the Chinese. In the 18 months leading up to Pearl Harbor, Mitsubishi Zero shot down 103 Chinese aircraft for the loss of just two planes, both caught by anti-aircraft fire. 
But despite warnings of its dominance from US pilots in the Chinese Air Force, the US armed forces paid the Zero little attention. The American volunteer group, the so-called Flying Tigers, they encounter Zeros in combat in 1940, long before Pearl Harbor. They found that the airplane could outclimb them, it could outturn them, it had acceleration that was beyond them, and it packed some potent firepower. But when they reported this back to Washington, no one would believe them. They go, we've got something to match the Zero. It can't be that great. They're wrong. American fighter airplanes at the beginning of the Second World War, they don't stand much of a chance against the Zero in air-to-air -air combat. It was certainly seen in the early days as the preeminent fighter in the Pacific theater to the point where uh, there was a famous phrase coined by American pilots that if you saw a Zero Sen in your immediate vicinity, you were outnumbered. If you're coming up against a Zero and you're in a single American aircraft, you're gonna lose. You're gonna lose because you can't keep pace with the Zero. It's faster, it's more maneuverable. Crucially, it could probably get in behind you much more quickly than you can get behind it. So if you're a single American aircraft, what you realize is a void. See that plane? Climbing to heaven like a skyrocket? Heaven's the wrong destination for that baby. That's a zero. The number one thing that American pilots are being told is don't dogfight the zero. The one benefit you might have is the deep dive. Dive away from it and get the hell out of there. As Japan carved out its South Pacific empire, the Zero ran rampant. However, it wasn't long before the cracks in Japan's strategy began to show. It may sound strange, but modern wars are not won and lost by fighting battles. Because the key to victory is factories. The Second World War is won or lost by military production. Much of the military history we read are wonderful stories. We read stories of combat, brilliant generalship, real people doing remarkable things. The real story of war being won or lost, though, is one of equipment production. It's a far more important story, and it involves everything. In the long term, it really doesn't matter if you lose 350 planes at Pearl Harbor, because you've got the capacity to make another 24,000 in the next year, just like the Americans do. In 1942, they make 42,000 aircraft. By 1944, they're making almost 90,000 aircraft. So the factory represents the great, you might say, strategic weapon of the Second World War. I mean, this is industrial production on, on a scale that just dwarfs what the Japanese can do. By the end of the war, the Japanese have built just over 50,000 combat planes. The Americans, they churned out more than 300,000. You can't argue with numbers like that and you can't fight and beat numbers like that. And the very nature of the Japanese empire was starting to work against it. The Japanese plan was to use the resources of the Dutch East Indies, that's coal, steel and oil, to supply the factories in mainland Japan. And to do that, it had to use shipping and it actually built two and a half million tons of ships which meant they were able to effectively link all the way through the southern Pacific to Japan, providing the resources to build aircraft, tanks, everything they needed for the war. And that was fine till America takes Guadalcanal. They capture the Marianas Islands. And what they're able to do then is use their submarines to get amongst these Japanese vessels and begin sinking them in enormous numbers. They're then able to use aircraft to actually strike at the shipping, sinking even more. They actually lose about a million tons of shipping. Ultimately, the Americans are able to use their fleet of heavy bombers flying from the Marianas to strike at factories in Japan itself. That would prove fatal. Because no matter how many excellent planes they may produce, the war factories of Japan do not exist in isolation. The factory represents the end of a long strategic process. It's not just sitting there churning out goods. You have to get goods to it. So a, a huge amount of effort in the Second World War is just to ship the raw materials across thousands of miles to get them to the factory. And very rarely is it one factory. 
When you're talking about a, a piece of modern machinery, such as an advanced aircraft, these have 100,000 pieces. You're talking a number of factory buildings. The production problem was made worse by the philosophy of the military in charge. The Japanese army and the navy seemed to do things totally independently of each other. They didn't seem on the same page pretty much about anything. The navy develops the Zero, one of the greatest fighters in the war. Do they transfer that technology to the army? No. This is a farcical situation. You've got the Japanese, they've got the best fighter on the planet, but only one half of their armed forces are actually using it. Nuts. Added to this was the short-term nature of Japanese military thinking. The Japanese high command had made this really huge assumption, and that was that the Americans are going to sue for peace immediately after the disaster at Pearl Harbor uh, and the capture of the Philippines by the Japanese. I think they saw a campaign that was perhaps only going to last maybe 18 months, two years perhaps at the most. And actually, you can see this reflected in their aircraft design because the Zero was so all-conquering, the Japanese Navy didn't really anticipate the need for a replacement until, what, well into 1943. You're not looking to develop a high-deck aircraft three or four years down the road. You're looking at building things that can win the war for you now. As the war progressed, Japan's aging fleet of Zeros was being stretched thinner and thinner. It would eventually snap at a place called Midway. The long, slow death of the Japanese Air Force began in June 1942 at the Battle of Midway. In the Battle of Midway, the Japanese sought to capture two islands, Sand Island and Eastern Island, what we call Midway Atoll. And their hope was that if they achieved this, they would be able to draw out what was left of American naval power in the Pacific for one decisive battle. Well, that's not exactly what happened. On the morning of the main action, June 4, 1942, the Japanese fleet undergoes this series of cascading attacks that begin with aircraft that are flying from Midway itself. And that culminates in what we call the famous four minutes. Between 10.20 and 10.24 a.m., when three out of four Japanese aircraft carriers are knocked out of the battle in swift succession. And the reason why they're knocked out is because this American tactic of actually forcing the Japanese combat air patrol aircraft down to a low level. So when these American devastator torpedo bombers mount this low level attack, you know, what they're doing is that they're drawing down these hornet's nests of these circling zeros. The Japanese combat air patrol flew in and engaged all of the torpedo planes. Shot them all down, destroyed them. There was nothing left of the squadron. So the Zeros have been in a dogfight, and they may have won that particular scrap, but they've got a big problem, because that's been very expensive in terms of fuel. They had been engaged in high-performance air-to-air combat, and so those aircraft had to land so that they could refuel and rearm. Now, it's the timing at this juncture that's absolutely critical. You've got all the Zeros back on their carriers, being refueled, rearmed, and that everything else was being refueled and rearmed below deck. They're completely vulnerable. And of course, what happens is that suddenly coming out the sky, you've got this group of American dauntless dive bombers appearing, and they can just see these completely defenseless carriers below them. When the American dive bombers begin diving down on the Japanese carriers, their bombs penetrate the deck, explode on the hangar deck, and set off secondary explosions. Explosions that are then fueled by fuel lines. The Japanese have effectively fallen into an American trap. In just four minutes, you've just got a single group of American dauntless dive bombers turning three Japanese aircraft carriers into basically funeral cars. By the time that the Battle of Midway is over, the Japanese have lost hundreds of irreplaceable and accomplished naval aviators, and they've lost four fleet aircraft carriers. 
Midway was a turning point, not just because the Japanese lost so many planes, but because they lost over a third of their most experienced pilots in the firestorm. Japanese Naval Air Force entered World War II with possibly the most experienced and skilled cadre of naval aviators across the board. The only problem is there aren't that many of them. So you're dealing with at most 2,000 really well-trained aviators on which the Japanese naval war effort relies. As pilot losses began to mount, replacements were in short supply. To train someone to be a pilot is a very complex process. What really matters when you train a pilot is how many hours he's flown before he's thrown into combat. Crucially, you have to put them in the cockpit. They actually have to have time to learn how the engines felt, the thrust, how the airframe worked together. So in 1942, the typical Japanese Navy pilot could expect to put in some, what, 800 hours in a plane before he sees combat. By 1944, that halves, and you've got some pilots going into action with fewer than 300 hours flight time logged. So as they headed into 1943, the pilots of the Imperial Japanese Navy were becoming less and less experienced and flying ever older planes. That would come back to haunt them when the Americans struck back, two years later at the Battle of the Philippine Sea. The greatest naval aviation battle of the Second World War is the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which is to determine control of the Mariana Islands. It involves 24 aircraft carriers and more than 1,300 aircraft. Now, what it's most famous for is something called the Great Mariana's Turkey Shoot, because over the space of two days, from June the 19th to June the 20th, 1944, the Japanese lose 426 aircraft in a series of all these suicidal attacks against the American fleet. And the bulk of those aircraft are zeros, because again, the only fighter that the Japanese Navy had available to protect its torpedo and dive bombers was zeros. They call it the Great Mariana's Turkey Shoot for a really good reason. The zeros were actually really easy to shoot down, and it actually reminded one American pilot of the turkey shoots he used to take part in at home. It's an apt name for what was a very one-sided engagement. What the Americans say is the Japanese were brave. They would take extraordinary risks to try and do their mission, but simply had not been trained well enough to you know, fight directly with the well-trained American naval aviators. Now, the pilot attrition of the last two years was really beginning to bite. By 1944, two-thirds of the experienced pilots who had actually led the attack on Pearl Harbor were either dead or unable to fly anymore. So this means that only about a third of the pilots who flew into the Mariana's death trap knew what they were doing, and half of them didn't even make it to the combat zone. The distance is about like flying from London to New York. We're talking thousands and thousands of miles, and it's also over open ocean. So you've got these pilots flying the Zeros. They're no longer the steely-eyed, stone-cold warriors they used to be. And you know what? It showed. When the dust settles at the end of the Battle of the Philippine Sea, twice as many Japanese aircraft have been lost trying to get to the battle as were lost in the Great Mariana's Turkey Shoot itself. On the other side, the Americans had evolved. Going back to 41, there was nothing that could take on the Zero. But by 42, in the United States Navy, you had uh, pilots that were flying in two ship formations, what they called the beam defense, what we called today the thatch weave. Named after the American naval aviator who designs it, which basically says the problem we have is that the Zero can outmaneuver us and get behind us. So what we'll do is we'll basically have two aircraft going zigzagging around each other. And as they flew into a combat environment where the enemy was present, they would simply watch the other pilot, and if the other pilot noticed that a Zero was setting up for an attack, he would turn in toward his wingman. The wingman would then turn in, and the process of the aircraft weaving through one another would bring the Zero within the gun sight of the trailing aircraft. To make matters worse, a barely noticed incident on the periphery of the Midway campaign two years earlier 
was about to pay great dividends to the US war effort in the skies. In 1942, as the Japanese are preparing to attack Midway, they launch a diversionary attack on the Aleutian Islands to try and draw American forces off. That ends up being unimportant for the battle. The Americans don't take the bait. But one thing that does happen is a Japanese Zero crashes into the soft, boggy soil of the Aleutian Islands. It dug in and went straight over and flipped over onto its back. The pilot was killed instantly, and the aircraft was there intact. And a Catalina, an American flying boat, happened to be doing a patrol in that particular area and saw this Zero belly up on the grass. The US military then ultimately recovered the aircraft, took it back to the United States, returned it to airworthy condition, and then conducted significant test and evaluation flights with it. And they're able to fully test and see what the enemy has. On the one hand, they understand now its aerodynamic capacity, why it can fly so well, but they also see its weakness. The Zero is a brilliant boxer with a great right hook, but a glass jaw. It has a punch, it's fast, it floats. It's Muhammad Ali in terms of its offensive capacity, but it's a terrible fighter as a defender. Because to be as fast and long range as it is, it had to have almost no armor protection. If you only needed to put one round in this aircraft and it just blew up. And so, the tactics employed by American Navy and Army fighters in the years that followed, all the way through to 1945, were informed by what we learned from that aircraft. And the darkest days were still to come. When the Americans take the Marianas in the summer of 1944, they can start transferring the, the famous B-29 bombers to the Marianas, and they can reach about two-thirds of Japan. B-29 bombers begin to subject the Japanese to a protracted strategic air campaign. Crucially, they can reach many of the great industrial cities of the time, industrial cities such as Nagoya, which were very famous for aircraft production. And they begin this assault on Japanese factories and Japanese aircraft production. On the 13th and 19th of December 1944, US aircraft bombed the two great Mitsubishi factories at Nagoya in Japan. Now, those raids were devastating because they damaged the main engine factory and the factory that made the airframes. Net effect, this cuts production of the Zero by one third. What this meant is that the Japanese weren't just going to lose planes en route to the war zone, they were going to start losing planes before they had even been built. As the war reached its most desperate stage, the severe lack of planes and fuel caused by American bombing forced the Japanese to extreme measures. What had once been the Lord of the Skies was now converted into little more than a guided missile. By 1945, the Zero is repurposed as a kamikaze aircraft. They find that the Zero is an especially effective aircraft for getting in close and striking the desired target. Japan's kamikaze tactics are usually portrayed as some kind of cultural death wish, but actually it had a kind of logic to it. If you look at the kamikaze as a strategic choice, it is one the Japanese take because of the Japanese pilots aren't as great and their aircraft have weaknesses. So what do you do? Fly the aircraft into someone. You didn't have to waste much time training your pilot to do anything more with it, fly straight. It's morbid, but if you don't have to come back, you can go a lot farther. You only needed enough fuel for a one-way mission. Of course, you were guaranteed to lose one pilot. But if the attack was successful, you would also cause the Americans to lose one ship and several men on board. So, you know, if you put it on a balance sheet, kamikaze attacks make quite a lot of sense. It also persuaded the Americans the cost of landing on the Japanese home islands would be too great. So they decided to end the war swiftly, in the most horrific way possible. The American strategic air campaign against the Japanese home island then goes through the ultimate end all of escalations when, on August 6, 1945, an atomic bomb is used against the city of Hiroshima. And then on August 9, 1945, an atomic bomb is used against the city of Nagasaki. 
right in the middle of all of that, on August 8, 1945, the Soviet Union declares war against Japan. And these events all coming together, they force Emperor Hirohito to reach the conclusion that the Japanese nation can no longer continue fighting. And for that reason, in the second week of August of 45, the Japanese reach out to the United States to negotiate terms of the surrender. The Second World War is over. But while the Zero and its makers have failed to win the war, the lessons they have learned will serve them well in the peace to come. As suddenly as it started, the war came to an end and surrender ceremonies aboard the Missouri. 2nd of September, 1945. US General Douglas MacArthur accepts the official Japanese surrender on board the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Things looked bleak for Japanese zaibatsu like Mitsubishi, which the Americans planned to shut down. What saved them was communism. Japan, like West Germany, is actually saved by the Cold War, and the Japanese had a hand in this themselves because you have an occasion when the Japanese Prime Minister visits Chairman Mao in Beijing in 1972, and he personally apologizes for the Japanese invasion of China. And what Mao is said to have replied, something on the lines of, you don't need to apologize because if you hadn't done that, the Chinese Communist Party would never have survived. So when Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communists seize power and the nationalists of China are thrown out, all of a sudden Japan now seems indeed as a way to hold the line against an advancing communist power. So the Americans become less hostile to the Zaibatsu and companies like Mitsubishi than they had originally intended to be. The Zaibatsu are broken up, but they're replaced by Kairetsu, as they're called, which are large, much looser, but still interconnected networks of firms. Then, in June 1950, communist North Korea invaded its southern capitalist neighbor. The Korean War comes hot on the heels of the quote-unquote loss of China for the Americans. It's a double hammer blow. Japan's vital importance becomes instantly clear. Japan becomes essentially the forward base for the American and other forces fighting on the UN side in the Korean War. And so therefore, there's a lot of service production, if you will, to produce the various kinds of everyday goods that an army of that size constantly requires. And this does give a bit of a kickstart to quite a large part of the Japanese economy. What Japan essentially becomes is one giant war factory for the Americans in Korea. And you've got large firms like Mitsubishi that are able to use this to fund lots of lovely new investment projects that are gonna get Japan back on its feet. When does the Japanese car industry begin to take over the world? When does Japanese shipbuilding begin to take over the world? It's all in this period because you start needing this Japanese productive capacity. In the wake of the Korean War, Mitsubishi companies helped lead the way to Japan's unprecedented economic growth throughout the 1950s and 60s. So by 1951, you've got large firms like Mitsubishi. Now they're able to start putting themselves back together again and they're beginning to benefit from this kind of somewhat unique mix of corporate collectivism on one hand, and then you've got this kind of low tax incentives that are this really quite unique feature of the so-called Japanese economic miracle. And so you get the development of a highly successful economic model, which involves very efficient mass production of high quality consumer goods for both the domestic and increasingly global export market. And Mitsubishi's old wartime engineers would have a surprising role to play in one of the most iconic creations of Japan's economic revival. The Japanese bullet train is one of the symbols of the modern Japanese economy, and it symbolizes the supposed combination of extremely high tech with modern consumer society. But the bullet train was suffering from a technical glitch, which one of the designers of the Zero would have found all too familiar. 
take Tatsurara Matsudaro. Now, what he helped solve is one of the Zero's problems, and that is the flutter. The Zero is so light and so fast that actually at high speeds, or when it dives, it has a problem with stability. Now, it's the post-war period, and you're not making Zeros anymore. What are you making? You're making the fastest trains in the world. That actually poses many kinds of same aerodynamic problems. And so Matsudaro plays a key role in keeping the bullet train stable. It's thanks to his research on the Zero that the bullet train is able to speed along the rails incredibly fast. Matsudara wasn't the only wartime engineer in the Japanese National Railway whose brush with the Zero would leave his mark on the bullet train. You also have another engineering figure in the JNR, and that's a man called Tadano Miki. At the end of the war, there was a problem, was that the Zero wasn't fast enough to get through the American air defences, so they needed something a lot quicker. So what Miki was tasked with designing was something called the Cherry Blossom, or the Oka Bomber. The Oka Bomber looked like a bullet. If you looked at it, it was, it was like, well, probably more like a flying torpedo, actually. This was a jet-powered, single-seat aircraft with a pilot that carried explosives on it that would begin gliding toward the target. Then it would kick in three solid rocket booster engines that would propel it at a significantly greater speed toward the target, a speed so great that you just could not track it and deliver effective anti-aircraft fire against it. I'm amazed, actually astounded, that they even hit anything. That's the incredible part, that they managed to sink at least two ships with Oka bombers. Now, Miki, like Matsudara, is asked to bring his wartime experience to the challenge of streamlining the Shinkansen bullet train. Now, the aerodynamic challenges presented by a kamikaze plane diving are not that much different than posed by a bullet trains at high speeds. And so you, he can take the sort of experience from designing these aircraft and move it to the design of the bullet train. And what he creates is this absolutely unique bullet-shaped nose which gives the Shinkansen its nickname, the bullet train. And if you look at a picture of the Oka bomber, what do you see? You see that influence in the bullet train's design. So you know, you've got this situation, what was originally designed as a suicide bomber has a far more productive and peaceful purpose as a key part of Japan's high-speed railway network. This might never have happened if the pressures of war had not pushed Japan's engineers to the limits of their ingenuity. Most Japanese military engineers end up serving the Japanese civilian economy and ser serving it very, very well. So throughout the 1960s and 1970s, Japan is at the center of a whole succession of major innovations in consumer products, such as washing machines, motor cars, radios, televisions, and the like. The technology behind the Mitsubishi Zero and its successors has played a key role in raising the land of the rising sun like a phoenix from the ashes of defeat, helping it lead the way to the future of the world. And as Mickey himself puts it, technology is inherently something that makes people happy. That's how it should be. And he was dead right. The Avro Lancaster, one of the most iconic British aircraft of the Second World War. People always celebrate the Spitfire and the Hurricane, but let's not forget the Lancaster is surely just as iconic. My great uncle flew in them in World War II, in the latter part of World War II. I get weepy every time I get within 100 feet of a Lancaster bomber, and I get massively excited every time I see one in a fly path. What started out as a deadly design... The Manchester was killing crews. ..turned into a pilot's dream. They called it from a beast to a beauty, because the Lancaster was a beauty. The Lancaster's unique capabilities helped change the course of the war in Europe. It plays an extremely important part in winning the Second World War. This is the story of the Avro Lancaster and of the war factory that built it. Nineteen thirty six. As Hitler's Nazi Germany turns its factories to military production, Britain prepares for war. There was uh, very much 
uh, a possibility of war in Europe. Hitler had become chancellor in 33. Luftwaffe had been officially unveiled shortly thereafter. So there was no kidding themselves to the fact that there was a rising power in, in continental Europe. It's terrifyingly clear to British high command that Britain does not have the war machinery it needs to compete with Hitler. The British government urgently needs new aircraft. The emphasis in the beginning is on fighters, not bombers, and that's mainly because of cost. You can build four fighters for the price of a single bomber, but the British High Command know that they also need those bombers. A bomber needs to do a few things. It needs to fly a significant distance compared to most aircraft at the time. You had to start extending range, and you had to extend payload. You actually have to carry bombs. Those specs call for an aircraft that can match German bombers in delivering destruction. The Air Ministry issues specification P-13-36 for a new bomber. The specification asked for a six-crew aeroplane that could carry 8,000 pounds of bombs, fly at 275 miles an hour and at 15,000 feet. Uh, that was not going to be an easily achievable aim. Uh, building a bomber is a, is a vast task from an engineering standpoint. So they really are asking quite a lot of the aircraft, and they want to do it, and this is another thing, in a two-engine bomber. This is a really tall order, not least because as well that this, all of this has to be achievable using two Rolls-Royce Vulture engines, which are still in development at the time. But this is music to the ears of a struggling little aeroplane company called Avro. Avro was born out of one young man's dreams of flying. Avro is started by a man called Sir Edwin Elliot Verdin Rowe, A.V. Rowe. So that, of course, is where the name comes from. Together with his brother Humphrey, Edwin Rowe founds the A.V. Rowe Aircraft Company in a basement in Manchester in 1910. World War I provides it with just the lift it needs to get off the ground. And the military knows they're going to need some new aircraft. So what they do is that they order up a whole series of aeroplanes and seaplanes from A.V. Rowe. And that is just keeping the Manchester factory absolutely humming. But after the end of the war, a slump in demand rings big changes at Avro. So after the First World War, military contracts were cancelled and it became the lean years. It became a very difficult time. Obviously, nobody needs a constant, constant supply of military aeroplanes anymore, and so money is really hard to come by, and eventually Avro is sold to Crossley Motors, who want the factory space to build cars, and in 1928, A.V. Rowe resigns from the company. A brand new management at Avro tries to build the business back up. It's a really ambitious move, but it's led by this really legendary lead designer at Avro, and he's a man called Roy Chadwick. Roy Chadwick has been at Avro almost from the start. By this stage, he and general manager Roy Dobson are now running the company. Roy Chadwick, I think, very fortunately, met AV in the very early days. And I think they hit it off straight away, if you like. They both had the same and similar ideas about how an aircraft should be designed, and they had the same enthusiasm for aviation at a time when many people thought that flying was against nature's needs and it shouldn't happen, and it was wrong for people to fly. Chadwick's a real character, frankly, but he's also a brilliant designer, and he learns his craft from Rowe himself, and he actually holds to Rowe's design ethos. AV's mantra was build it strong, build it light, and build it powerful, because the the horsepower of engines in, uh, in their day, you had to be as light as possible to be able to fly as high as you could. So when the P-13 tender comes around in 1936, Chadwick has to employ all his persuasive skills to get the contract for the new bomber. Chadwick was able to convince the Air Ministry, because of his previous history, that he could meet, and more, all the specifications in the contract. Once the Air Ministry gets on board, a new bomber is born. There's a tradition that bombers are named after town, so that's it. They are now actively pursuing building a Manchester bomber. The first prototype 
Manchester L7246, rolls off the Avro lines and begins flight testing in July 1939. But things don't fly smoothly. The problem when the Manchester's tested is that the rudders don't provide enough control, the engine runs too hot, and the hydraulics are rubbish. Everything stems from issues with the vulture engines that they were being told they had to use. That you can have a brilliant airframe, but it doesn't matter if you don't have the right engine to power it. But despite its faults, Bomber Command and the Air Ministry stuck with this aeroplane because they desperately needed it. They had nothing else, effectively. They commissioned this thing anyway, and they order from Avro 200 of 1,200 Manchester bombers. But it just becomes increasingly obvious that they're not up to the task, and so um, the government orders them to cease production. But Roy Chadwick isn't having any of this. Chadwick realised pretty early on that the, uh, the engine issue with the um, Voltis wasn't going to be solved satisfactorily. He could see that that engine was going to ruin his aircraft if he couldn't get that changed. And what he does is adapt the Manchester and replaces the two dud Vulture engines with four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines instead, and it makes the world of difference. Chadwick proposes a new, updated version of the Manchester, powered by these new engines. He calls it Type 683. As an engineer, he can look at the Manchester and say, actually, the airframe's fine. You can make the airframe bigger. So we can move from two mediocre engines to four excellent Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, and all of a sudden move from a medium bomber with flaws to a large bomber that can be very effective. Type 683 now gets an official name, and the Lancaster bomber is born. After weeks of poor weather, on the 9th of January 1941, Chadwick's four-engine bomber taxis out for her maiden flight. The first test flight, um, the poor guys flying it had tested the Manchester, which had nearly killed them, so they can't have been that enthusiastic about getting into a really similar aeroplane. They were only meant to be up in the air for not very long, but they were up there for much, much longer. And they did a low fly past and dipped the wings, and they just said how fantastic it was. The test pilot came back, and he was absolutely uh, cock a hoop with the performance of the aeroplane. And they were smiling, absolutely beaming, and they called it from a beast to a beauty. And in June of 1941, the Air Ministry issues a contract to Avro for almost 500 Lancasters. It's a huge order, but Avro is ready for it. Avro had a good uh, setup for building the aircraft. Uh, they had learned building techniques and experience from the Manchester, so they were hitting the ground running, as it were. When they went into production at, towards the end of 1941, and they were still building Lancasters at the end of the war. The Lancaster inspired extreme devotion, not just in its air crews, but in the ground crews that maintained it. As a full-scale replica airframe at the Avro Museum in Stockport, Cheshire, shows. My late father was a ground engineer on the original aircraft, S for Sugar, which is now at Hendon. He went on to restore that aircraft post-war, so consequently I grew up working on the aircraft with him and um, it had quite a big impact on me. So after my father passed away, some years after, I used my income to uh, create this airframe that you see behind you um, with the express purpose of enabling the general public to go on board, learn about the Lancaster. In my opinion, World War II could not have been won without the Lancaster. With the success of Chadwick's designs, Avro expands its production lines. The government gives Avro a grant of one million pounds to build a new factory at Chatterton. Now, it's a really beautiful building, but you know even Chatterton isn't big enough because what Britain needs are more and more planes. And of course, what does that mean? Avro needs more and more factories. So what Avro decides to do is to build their next plant at Yeadon in Yorkshire 
on the site of the Leeds Bradford Municipal Airport. It's actually going to be the largest factory under one roof in all of Europe. And Avro's going to need it, because the Lancaster is about to show the German people what it means to start a total war. Avro's Yeadon plant opens in February 1941. Yeadon's an incredible factory. The floor space takes up about one and a half million feet. I mean, that is huge. There are thousands of people working at this plant. It's like a small town, but all under a roof. One of the people working there was Lillian Grundy, a young shop assistant who finds herself drafted into the factory. I was 16 when the war started. I worked at the old toffee factory at Whitefield. And a woman came one day and asked a lot of personal questions. About a month after, I was called up to go and see this A.V. Rose. That would be about early, 41, and I'd be 18. The war factory where Lillian worked was an impressive size. It presented a massive target for German bombers, as the story of nearby Chatterton shows. As a factory manufacturing bomber aircraft, it's always going to be a target for the enemy. Um, and on Easter Monday, 1941, uh, German bomber aircraft find the factory and drop bombs. Thankfully, it's Easter Monday. The workers are off on their Easter holidays, so there's almost no one inside and there are no casualties. But then it makes them think about how to protect the factory from any further attack. To protect the massive Yeadon factory, Avro needs to think outside the fuselage. General Manager Roy Dobson completely understands the vulnerability of the factory better than anyone else. And he knows that you know, just one bombing raid could cripple the entire plant and could stall production indefinitely. So he comes up with what we always call in Britain a cunning plan. What he does is to call in designers from the film industry. What they do is that they bank up earth at 45 degrees all the way around the walls to eliminate any shadows being cast from the walls. And do the roof up so that when you look at it from above as a German bomber, you see mock houses, farms, trees, everything. They even had artificial cows and they would move them on a daily basis. And they even tried to change it for the seasons, so they would have leaves and so on and so forth. Absolutely astonishing, and there are some wonderful photographs of that. Quite amazing. But even with the extra capacity at the factories, demand for Lancasters soon outstrips Avro's ability to produce them. 55,000 parts make up a Lancaster. So that is an enormous number of parts that have to come in from war factories all over the country. You then have to spend 70,000 man hours doing half a million individual processes to come up with a finished aeroplane. At the peak of Lancaster production, Avro employs 40,000 people. But actually, it's a lot more than that, because if you include all the subcontractors, it was estimated that you have more than a million people taking part in putting the Lancaster together. It is a great testament to the, the people from Avro in particular and all these other subcontractors and other factories that uh, during the height of the war, seven or eight a day were coming out of production. Lillian played her part in this process by making the ties that bound the front of the plane together. I was there on the machine and we made big screws. It was uh, hard work, 12 hours a night. The women was on all the makeups and lays, and the machine was, well, I would say, 50 times bigger than me. We wore a hat to put all your hair in, cos the drill going round would have sculpture. They were only your feet not moving. Everything else was moving, and your brain had to keep alert, cos the machine was going round and round and round with this job, and it would tear your fingers. So you had to watch all the time. When I first went, I told my fingers a few times. <laughs> yes. 
and the Lancasters are needed to open a new front in the war immediately. And then you have the person of Arthur Harris come into the equation, who takes over bomber command in, in 1942. Harris is a committed believer in city bombing, that he really believes that Britain can, can drive Germany out of the war by laying waste to its cities. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet. Germany will make a most interesting initial experiment. When Harris is talking about attacking a German city, you will devastate everything about that city. Fly at night with masses of bombers. Don't worry about hitting individual small targets, just blanket an area. At the end of May 1942, Harris launches the first thousand bomber raid designed to obliterate the rail links and factories in one of Germany's key industrial cities. The thousand bomber raid on Cologne is over in 90 minutes, but in that time, they managed to start 2,500 fires and destroy or damage 13,000 buildings. It's shocking and devastating to the people on the ground. The raid was intended to cripple the city's industry while protecting the bombers through sheer weight of numbers. The raid is a success in that they only lose 4% of the aircraft that left Britain to take part in it. So yes, it absolutely works. And yet, a month later, the city is beginning to get back to work so that the long-term impacts of the Cologne raid don't live up to the immediate hype of the moment when it seemed to be so devastating in such a turn. This is why many people today question Bomber Harris's methods, though some still support him. The Thousand Bomber raids were primarily to hit industrial areas. Yes, civilian areas unfortunately got hit, but it wasn't quite the same as the Blitz on London or somewhere like that. So actually, I think Bomber Harris has been slightly hard done by by some of the criticism, and I think that's unwinding now. I think that people realise that those raids hit and destabilised a lot of the industrial production, which actually foreshortened the war. Without it, the war may have gone on longer than it did. But thousand bomber raids don't come cheap, and someone has to make the bombers to fly them. To fulfill the insatiable demand, Avro's war factories are working round the clock. During the war, the work regime was extremely, extremely tough. It was a 12-hour shift, it was 24-hour production. And it was freezing cold. The doors opened at back of you for them to take the wings out, which the riveters did. They were up ladders, riveting, so it was noisy. Everywhere you went was noise, noise, noise. Don't forget we was doing a man's job. We only got ladies' pay. Despite working at full capacity, the Lancasters don't come in unlimited numbers. To keep up the pressure, British High Command needs to find a way of hitting German industry using fewer planes. What Bomber Command needs to do is come up with a more strategic way of doing things. So find a target that can be attacked by a much smaller force but will cause maximum devastation to the Nazi war effort. The River Valley of the Ruhr is where many Nazi war factories are based. Destroying them would be a big step towards winning the war for the Allies. They are supplied by seven great dams, three of which are crucial targets. Because what the Ruhr factories are powered by is hydroelectricity, and that comes from these three great huge dams. So if these dams can be breached, not only will the factories grind to a halt, but they'll also flood the Ruhr, and they'll literally bog it down for months. The only problem is, where do you get something powerful enough to breach these really thick dams? Nineteen forty-two. British High Command wants to hit the industrial heart of Germany the Ruhr Valley. To do that, they must take out the dams at the top of the valley. 
but they don't have the right tools to target them. Yet. Even before the war, the British Air Ministry has long identified the Ruhr Valley as a key strategic target. You know, because we know that what wins wars are factories, and the factories of the Ruhr Valley are the key to Hitler's warfighting ability. So you've got these three great big dams around the valley, and they're holding back these massive lakes, and they are providing huge amounts of hydroelectric power, and all that power is used for making steel. Therefore, instead of taking out all of the individual factories, if you take out the dams, not only will they have no power to work, but you can devastate the area with flooding as well. But the problem is, is these dams are 40 metres thick. That is seriously thick. They're going to withstand a few poxy bombs. So what the RAF calculate is that a direct hit with large bombs might just do the trick, and it needs pinpoint accuracy. The problem, where do you get that? One man is obsessed with the idea and will stop at nothing to achieve it. His name is Barnes Wallace. Barnes Wallace is what would have been known at the time as a boffin. He's, he's the assistant chief uh, a designer for Vickers and on the outbreak of war, he just comes up with idea after, after idea on how Britain could win the war using technology. He's absolutely ideal because he, he's not somebody that, that, that looks at things in a conventional way. Barnes Wallace and his team closely research the biggest weaknesses in the dam structures. The problem you've got with trying to breach a dam is it's designed to, in fact, resist thousands, millions of tonnes of pressure. And very importantly, very difficult to bomb because it's a very, very small thin target. And a bomb bursting in water isn't very effective. One solution would be a torpedo. It works with ships. But a torpedo won't work because the Germans have already thought of that. It's obvious. Um, so what they've done is string a traditional torpedo net in front of the dam so that if you do try that, um, it will catch the torpedo. And if it does go off, it'll be too far away from the dam to cause any damage. So his thought is that he knows that an explosive force in contact with the actual dam wall will produce an effect that will push out the masonry and very importantly allow the millions of tonnes of water to then exploit even the smallest crack or fissure. You don't have to blow it to bits, you would have to weaken it enough for all of that pressure to push the dam away. Wallace turns to his own interest in naval history and a friend's expertise in the sport of cricket for a solution. The idea is, um, and it's taken from uh, Nelson's captains, they used to fire a cannonball so that it skimmed off the water and would bounce. Um, and this is the principle, to get the bomb to land right next to the masonry to blow it sky high and breach the dam. But getting a bomb to bounce on water isn't easy. Early in the experiments with a bomb, Barnes-Wallace discovered a problem. When it hit the water, it sank. But he happens to have a conversation with a colleague who was a member of a local cricket club. And he pointed out that if you impart a backspin on a cricket ball, it will bounce across the grass. The question was, therefore, if you could get a backspin on the bomb, would it bounce across the water. If you spin it backwards, not only will it give it the momentum to get close to the wall, but it will stop it from then bouncing too far away from the wall before it explodes, so it's perfect. So he needs to transfer that concept from a tiny little cricket ball to a whopping great big bomb. In 1942, Wallace presents his idea to the government's scientific advisers and gets the green light to conduct aerial tests. Initial tests aren't necessarily great. They have some where the bomb breaks up on hitting the water. They have some where it just sinks like a stone. And then eventually, they manage to launch this bomb exactly the right height, exactly the right time. He finally gets it right. Because on the 23rd of January 1943, the bomb gets dropped at almost 300 miles an hour and incredible incredibly low altitude of just 42 feet. And it bounces 13 times 
and lands right on target. But to duplicate that in combat conditions is going to be a real challenge. They need to be able to release the bomb at a specific altitude. And since this would be a nighttime raid, they came up with a system of two lights directed down beneath the aircraft so that the crew simply looked down to where the two lights came together as one, and that was the correct altitude for release. But the particular nature of the bomb made transporting it difficult. One problem with delivering the bomb is that there's only one aircraft that can do it. All other aircraft available in the RAF are too small. To actually make the bomb rotate, what you have to do is put a device below the bomb bay, linked chains driven by a motor in the aircraft so that the bomb is rotating correctly at the correct speed. Only the Lancaster had the capacity to fit this device. The Lancaster has a great long bomb bay, so it can be adaptable to the longest and heaviest bomb. So it can carry a huge load and deliver a huge load. And it had one other unique feature which made it the perfect fit for the delivery mechanism. This is the uh, main spar, which goes from wingtip to wingtip and passes through the centre of gravity of the aircraft. And it's um, speculation on my part, but I would imagine the bomb would have been uh, hung directly underneath the main spar because that would offer the greatest um, aircraft trim with which to carry the bomb safely. So for the bouncing bomb to fly, Barnes Wallace needs Avro on his side. So you have this key meeting on the 26th of February where Wallace meets Avro Lancaster's designer Roy Chadwick and he asks him directly, can you modify these Lancasters? Without a pause, Chadwick looks at him and says, you know what, I can do it. And all I need is Vickers to handle the attachment arms and the driving mechanisms to spin up the bombs, and then we could get it done. Tests of the new Lancasters and the new bomb reveal the magnitude of the task ahead. By the time it's ready to go, upkeep, the bouncing bomb, weighs 9,000 pounds. It needs to be spun up to 500 rotations per minute before it leaves the aircraft. And that's not all. In order to work properly, the bomb is going to be dropped over water at a height of precisely 60 feet from an aircraft travelling at precisely 232 miles an hour. You know, that's not a lot of wiggle room. You know, it's a really big arse from the air crews. And don't forget, they're not doing it over a nice peaceful lake. They're doing it while being fired upon by the Germans. To carry out this Herculean mission, the RAF taps its most famous pilot, Wing Commander Guy Gibson. You know, he may be young, uh, he's only in his early 20s, but he's very experienced and he's exactly what the RAF needs. And he's called in and he's asked to put together a squadron of the very best air crews in Britain. Gibson assembles his squadron in Lincolnshire and he has them training on low-level flying in Lancaster. So first of all, they're going all about the country at 200 feet and then perilously down to 150 feet, which is not only exhilarating but pretty terrifying as well because there's no room for error. Right up to the last minute, the crews are kept in the dark about their real target. The ultimate test for the Lancaster comes in spring 1943. On the 16th of May 1943, 19 Lancasters take off in three waves for Operation Chastise. With the intention of destroying three dams in the Ruhr Valley. To do that, they take off from Scampton in Lincolnshire. And they head out over the North Sea, and they're obviously going right into Nazi Germany. For the raid to succeed, accurate navigation was key. We're in the navigator's crew station here, and that navigator would have been shrouded in darkness behind a curtain, and that's so that he could look at his maps with a, a light on internally in the aircraft, but no light was emitted because that could be easily spotted by night fighters coming up on the aircraft. The navigator used um, dead reckoning, so they were using map reading and uh, compass 
bearings. They have to fly at 200 feet right across the North Sea, basically below radar. But anything else that goes wrong, anyone makes a mistake, they're, they're gone quickly. OK, uh, where I'm stood, this is where the flight engineer's crew station is. When he was facing forward, he was looking after this half of the panel, with which he was able to monitor flaps, oxygen, uh, brakes. That enabled the pilot the freedom to monitor his main instruments on what's known as the blind flying panel. And they're all the instruments that the pilot needs to fly the aircraft safely. Uh, such as airspeed, altitude, um, is artificial horizon. And the pilot cannot be distracted because the approach to the dams is extremely treacherous. In one case, it's a steep wooded valley. The approach is absolutely staggeringly dangerous. The Nazis, of course, know something might happen. They've got anti-aircraft guns ready to try and shoot down any aircraft coming in. To succeed, the Lancasters must fly absolutely straight into the teeth of enemy fire. As soon as the bombers arrive in the area of the dams, all of the anti-aircraft fire jumps into action. So what the pilots are faced with is a terrifying run. They have got to keep steady and keep true. They can't dodge or anything. They've got to fly straight through a gauntlet in order to reach the point where they need to drop their bombs. This is because the bomb aimer can only do his job if the plane is flying straight and level. The bomb aimer would lie in the prone position here and essentially lean on his elbows to operate all of the equipment in this position. On the right of the bomb aimer's position, you'll see that there's an instrument panel there and the bomb aimer would essentially program all the information required to drop the bombs as accurately as possible into there, and the bombing computer would perform the calculations. The aircraft could not peel off and uh, get out of the target area. Instead, it had to continue flying straight and level for a prescribed period of time, um, normally in excess of 30 seconds, and the bombing computer would tell the F-24 camera to take the photograph. So at the exact moment that they burst, the uh, picture that's developed would show the bombs of this aircraft detonating. And you can only imagine the crew and the relief they felt when they could finally peel off and, and get out, out of that area. And it's Gibson himself, you know, real leader amongst men, and he's the one making the first run. Makes the first run, drops the bomb, and it fails to breach the dam. At this point, Gibson is um, concerned that the next attempt is going to be again distracted by German fire, so what he decides to do is run the gauntlet again and fly alongside in order to protect and divert some of the German fire away from the Lancaster attempting to drop the next bomb. I mean, that's seriously brave. You know, he's already flown into the jaws of death once and now he's going to do it again. The third and fourth runs don't work either and by this point, 617 Squadron are starting to think that these bombs just don't work. The Lancaster comes in just as the German gunners are running out of ammunition, drops its bomb, bounces, goes all the way up to the dam, sinks below the waterline, and then nothing happens. And then suddenly the dam simply collapses. The first one has gone. Upkeep has worked. At this point, a hundred yard breach opens up in the Moan Dam and water begins cascading down into the valley below. But Gibson knows the job is far from done. Two more dams have to be breached that night on the Eder and Sorper rivers. It takes four runs to breach the Eder Dam, but the Sorper proves an impossible nut to crack. The third dam, the Sorper Dam, is different and was always doubtful. It's an earthen structure and it's always been a concern that the bomb was not powerful enough to um, breach it. It takes something like 10 passes to even get a target lock on it, but even then it's unsuccessful and the dam isn't breached. But two dams have been breached. 
and millions of gallons of water are now roaring down the Ruhr Valley as planned. Basically, the raid is a huge success. You know, the floods are washing away roads and railways and bridges. Mines are flooded, 11 factories completely destroyed, more than 100 others damaged. And you just got you know, a huge, devastating impact on steel production in the Ruhr. And you know, that's dropped down to a quarter of the level of what it was before the raid. By far the greatest impact of the raid is the loss of hydroelectric power. You have two power stations wiped out. And the Germans admit that it hurts them. I mean, Albert Speer, the armaments minister, later admits that if the Sorper dam had been breached, it would have been a complete disaster. But that even with just two dams down, the raid was a disaster for us for many months. Those months would cover a critical turning point in the war when the Nazis desperately needed to replenish their forces. And while the dam busters grabbed the headlines, Britain's stalwart Lancasters would continue relentlessly with the unglamorous job of pounding Germany's industry to rubble. The German economy goes into a tailspin because now strategic bombing is beginning to shut down the German economy through transportation and fuel. So if you add all those together, it plays an extremely important part in winning the Second World War. All of this together in aggregate produces a rapid unraveling of German industrial capability. They can't produce at the factories because they're being bombed on a regular basis. And more and more rolling stock is being destroyed. It's irreplaceable. Hitler's armaments minister finally has to admit defeat. In January 1945, Albert Speer ran the numbers on what the bombing campaign had done to his factory schedules in 1944. He reckoned that Germany had produced 35% fewer tanks, 31% fewer planes and 42% fewer lorries due to bombing than it should have done that year. To him, it's the transportation attacks. It's the attack on the railways and, and uh, the ability to move coal, you know, to fire the, the power plants and to move things around the good. He believes this is devastating and in the sense he's right. It's Speer who comes to Hitler at the end of January 45 and he says to him, the war is over in the area of heavy industry and armaments. We're done. We can no longer fight. Now, that's a kind of crippling admission. Uh, you know, this is a man who boasted that he could increase German industrial production threefold. Basically, the bombers, led by the Lancaster, have utterly defeated him. The Lancaster bombers get one last chance to strike at Hitler, just five days before the Nazi Fuhrer takes his own life. So, on the 25th of April 45, you've got another great Lancaster headline grabbing raid, and they head for the Obersalzburg, which is Hitler's mountain retreat. Now, you know, some people suggest that the reason for this attack is simply to show the Germans, once and for all, that they're absolutely trounced. It's clearly a great propaganda victory. Look, it's all gone. Hitler's country retreat, dead. With Hitler defeated and the war over, Avro's massive factories must now find new markets. Similar to the First World War, Avro, after the Second World War, still had, um, you know, a reduction in orders. Um, contracts were, were, were stopped. And so they had to look for commercial flight and passenger flight. But it does take time to get into passenger aircraft. There's no doubt about it. But not long after the war, um, you know, the Cold War, really gave another boost to the Avro, the Avro story, if you like, because the Vulcan was being developed. Yes, the war factory attitude held them in good stead. Avro's post-war jet bomber was the Avro Vulcan, which relied a lot on the lessons that Avro had learned during World War II with the Lancaster. You think the Lancaster has a big bomb bay, you don't realise what big it is until you stand underneath the Vulcan and see the size of the bomb bay in that aeroplane. So you've gone to an air-pressured, nuclear-carrying, delta-wing um, aircraft that could fly at 57,000 feet, and all that in less than 50 years from AV's first flight in 1909. And that is a testament to Roy Chadwick, but Roy, unfortunately, never saw the fruition of it. Um, he was killed in 1947 in a crash just 300 yards from here. 
In 1963, the Avro name disappears as the company was absorbed into Hawker Siddeley Aviation. But the memory of its vital contribution to the war lives on. You only have to look at the statistics of the Lancaster to realize that it was the a kind of symbol of how brilliant British war factories had been. And actually, you know, without the help of the trusty Lancaster, of course, Hitler's war factories would never have been destroyed. This educational airframe, it's a tribute to 55,573 volunteer airmen that were lost flying on Bomber Command. World War II indeed could not have been won without the efforts of uh, Lancaster's serving on Bomber Command, which really sums up the reason why Bomber Harris called it his shining sword. People always celebrate the Spitfire and the Hurricane, but let's not forget the Lancaster is surely just as iconic and actually, in a way, was more of a war winner than those other two planes. This is the story of two guns. One would revolutionize the way we make things, the other would revolutionize revolution. But behind their success lay a very simple concept. They were incredibly reliable. You could use them just about anywhere. They would keep firing, whether it was in the desert of the American West, the jungles of Vietnam, the mud of northern France. The weapons just worked. You've got to be absolutely damn sure that if it does break down, you can fix it yourself right on the spot. And that's what these guns do. Colt and Kalashnikov. Two iconic names that conjure images of showdowns and revolution. But behind their success lay factories. When you think of Colt, you think of the Wild West, but you shouldn't. You should think of assembly lines, factories, and mass production. From the Cold War struggle in Berlin to far-flung places such as Vietnam, the Kalashnikov was used by all because these guns wouldn't just change the nature of warfare, they would change the world. Sometime in 1830, on board a brig bound for Calcutta, a young man called Samuel Colt had an idea. The story goes that Colt was just 16 and he's persuaded his father to let him go to sea, to study navigation firsthand. And it was there that as he was watching the other sailors use something called a capstan, which is essentially a rotating device to pull in sails. He was struck by the way that the revolving mechanism had a lock which stopped it from winding in reverse. Colt recalls that he had his great insight. What if he could use that same rotational mechanism for a revolver, for a new kind of gun that would revolutionize repeating weapons and maybe make him a large amount of money? So every moment of his spare time on that voyage, he sits down and he whittles a model prototype out of wood. And so the revolver was born. But the truth behind the myth is very different. That's the romantic version, the historical reality is that various other inventors had actually beaten Colt to at least some of his ideas. Importantly, the revolving pistol. And this example, made by a guy called Annerley, 150 years before Colt got things going, is actually an eight-shot revolver. So if you're looking for firepower, it's even more firepower than a Colt. You simply cock the gun, and the cylinder revolves. It's just like a Colt revolver in that respect. So Colt was definitely not the inventor of the revolver. His genius lay in borrowing existing technologies and combining them together. But just as critically with him was his marketing genius. You have to remember that Colt was a salesman and he was as, as interested in telling a story about his product as he was in selling you the product. He wanted a narrative. He wanted an origin story. And, and so he wove this great moment of insight while he was at sea as a teenager. The Annerley revolver was not very reliable, which is why we've hardly ever heard of it. 
But the problem it was trying to solve was one which had bedeviled firearms since their invention. At the beginning of the 19th century, this is what you're armed with as a cavalryman. You only get one shot. To make up for that, he's got two. Draw one, fire one, draw two, fire number two. But that's really it. And that leaves you pretty much thrown back in time to the medieval period. Not much different than a medieval knight, uh, different shape of blade, but nonetheless, it's a sword. If you could invent a weapon that fired quickly, that fired multiple shots uh, much faster than the others, you would have not only a great advantage on the battlefield, but if you were trying to sell it, you would have an enormous advantage in the business world. Colt had the idea for the weapon, but he needed money to get his new invention off the ground. The story of how he went about getting that money is almost crazier than the actual story of the weapon itself. The thing we all got to know about entrepreneurs is that they don't let anything get in their way, or at least no decent entrepreneur. And you know, these are the kind of people, you know, they don't, they don't just make lemonade out of lemons. What they do is they invent a lemon press <laughs> and then they figure out how to bottle the stuff so they can sell it to people by the million. Um, and if they don't have the money to do that, then they come up with a creative way of making money. What Samuel Cole did in an incredibly entrepreneurial fashion was he started touring the country and he sold people hits of laughing gas. And then what he does with all the profits he makes from his roadshow, he sinks them into hiring a gunsmith to build his prototype. And he uses that to take out a patent for what's called the Colt Patterson Revolver. On the 5th of March, Colt's patent arms manufacturing company was born and Colt built a factory at Patterson, New Jersey. But it didn't go well. Colt turned out to be better at the road show than he was actually at the production of the revolver. You're trying to sell a whole load of new stuff, new ideas to your client. And it was just too much um, for the US government, especially the US military, who actually would have to issue these things. At one point, the U.S. Army actually said that the revolver was too innovative and thus it would be dangerous to buy. He's managed to sell a few firearms during the Seminole Indian Wars in the late 1830s, but it's not enough to keep him afloat. And in 1842, he goes bankrupt. But those few firearms would eventually make Samuel Colt's fortune. Sometime in 1846, Colt had a meeting with a U.S. cavalryman called Samuel Walker, which would change his destiny. Walker believed that Colt's revolver had actually saved his life. His units attacked by um, 70 Comanche Indians. His men are able to fend them off because they can fire so many shots so quickly. The fact that the Colt patent revolver could fire five shots without reloading saved them from being overrun and killed. Had they had the single shot pistols, it would have been two shots and done. Walker suggested a few improvements, which would transform Colt's gun. We have two pistols here. This is the original Colt, the so-called Colt Patterson. It's a very technically sound design. Uh, it's rather small, as is very obvious. So when Colt comes back, he comes back big, what's called the Colt Dragoon which is what we have here. Right away, you can see the difference. Very small, very large. And it's not just about looks. Um, the size really does matter here. Bigger size means bigger caliber, a bigger bullet. It's gonna do more damage. A much bigger cylinder means a much bigger charge of gunpowder behind it. Faster bullet, harder hitting bullet. That's critical. The larger cylinder also means you can fit in one more shot, because five shots is good, six shots is even better. Times two, two pistols, gives you 12. Uh, really quite a leap forward. So for the time, this is the ultimate cavalry weapon. Thanks to this new design, the US government ordered 1,000 Colt Walker revolvers. Colt was able to raise the money to build a brand new factory in his hometown of Hartford, Connecticut. But this wasn't just any old weapons factory. This was something the world had never seen before.
Now, it's often said that actually the first ever mass-produced object was the gun. Now, there's some people who say that it really might have been the clock, uh, but the one that we know that was perfected was the gun. And the man at the forefront of this? None other than Colt. Because actually what he did was to hire an organisational genius called Alicia K. Root to run his factory. And what they created was essentially the world's first assembly line. Colt's factory was 500 feet long and 60 feet wide, and it was filled with a variety of machines to build each part of the revolver. So you had different areas of the factory floor doing different tasks, and then the gun would effectively come together down a production line, just like a modern factory. 80% of the work was done there in the Hartford plant on these enormous machines that are driven by steam. There were machines that bored out holes in the cylinders for the bullets. Then you had machines that bored the barrels, and then you had machines that fashioned the whole firing mechanism. There were machines for every part of the revolver. All of these individual parts being put together by this enormous workforce. To assemble the gun that Colt had imagined. What that does is streamline manufacturing to the extent that parts can come from all over a workshop floor, and they simply descend on one person who assembles the final firearm at the end with parts that are interchangeable from everything that was made inside that factory. Colt's factory was one of the first sort of war munition factories in existence. It's not just that the revolver was innovative, it's that the factory itself was a new thing. What we're looking at here is a classic assembly line. You know, we think assembly line, Henry Ford, Model T cars. I mean, this is way before that. Colt was doing it decades before in Hartford. Colt's Hartford assembly line churned out 150 guns a day. Cheap, fast firing and dependable, their reputation for reliability was built on one very simple concept. Before Colt, if you have a gun and part of it breaks, you have to go to a gunsmith who will make a part that will work purely and only for your gun. If you take it out, it won't work in another gun, even if it's the same broad kind of gun. By contrast with Colt, what you find is that if you take the rotating barrel out of one Colt and put it into another Colt, it will work perfectly well. The part is identical. This may seem easy and obvious, but it took genius to produce. The challenge is that uh, producing the machinery that will produce the interchangeable parts in the first place is technically very demanding. Just to put it in perspective, during the 20th century, long after the Industrial Revolution, when assembly line production techniques are in full use, there are times where multiple manufacturers are producing one firearm and parts won't interchange. But the truth behind the sales pitch is very different. Because what I'm holding in my hands is a reproduction, a modern replica of the 1851 Navy revolver made on modern machine tools to modern standards. So it interchanges without a problem. Let's just try that out with original 1851 navies. So disassemble the gun we want to place the part on. Moment of truth, it doesn't go. Not only does it not engage and turn and cock, it doesn't even fit the frame. So if you were to show this to one of Colt's prospective customers, they wouldn't be very impressed. You know what? It's all marketing. Because what Colt is, is a supreme self-publicist. His genius lies in convincing people that he could achieve the impossible before it had even been done. To achieve that, he's basically got to cheat. He's got to pre-select guns that already fit together quite well, maybe even get a gunsmith to hand file them all so they fit each other. They rigged it, essentially, so that it would look like the parts were interchangeable when they really weren't. This sort of faking of, of interchangeability is a really strong sign of how Colt was as much a salesman as he was an inventor. So in that way, he was kind of like the Steve Jobs of his day, selling this whole idea of the technological revolution long before he had actually achieved it. And he convinced people to pay him to make it a reality. Once it was a reality, Colt was quick to protect his investment. 
Samuel Colt is a great entrepreneur, but he's also one of the world's first and most prominent patent trolls. Uh, he patents his innovations as almost as soon as he makes them, and he then spends an amazing amount of time throughout his business career suing people who have violated his patents. The very name of the Colt company to this day is Colt's Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company. Um, and they don't just maintain that because it sounds old world and, and fun. In the early 19th century, when everyone is inventing all of the technology we now take for granted, it's absolutely essential to not only file patents for your novel designs, but also to have a team of lawyers going after you if you so much as look like you're infringing on his patents. But what would really make Colt's fortune was the world's first truly modern war. On the 12th of April, 1861, artillery attached to the South Carolina militia opened fire on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, firing the first shots of the American Civil War. It would prove to be the making of Colt. The American Civil War is in some ways the world's first great industrial war, because ultimately it's won by the sheer industrial might of the Union producing more men, materiel and guns than the Southern Confederacy. And many of those guns were provided by Samuel Colt. And not only do you need a hundred of these, a thousand of these, you need tens of thousands of these weapons. And this is an enormous opportunity for Colt. You have a guaranteed source of, of demand by the US government. You can then plan on producing mass amounts for numbers of years. By this point, Colt was so wealthy that he had created his own workers' city around the Hartford factory, Coltsville. Coltsville, in many ways, was like the Google or Apple campus is today. What it was was a kind of self-contained city within the bigger city of Hartford. And it's got its own ferry boat, it's got its own shops, railway depots, school, recreational facilities. It was this giant open area of land with sculpted terrain that had wildlife like deer and peacocks. It's even got its own church and a social hall for dances and lectures. And this is a big place, it can seat a thousand people. Colt was a man of ideas and those ideas fizzed and sprawled all over the place. He would spend the money to make his workers happy and fulfill his dreams. All of this was designed to attract skilled workers to his factory complex. They worked to a strictly regimented regime. Colt worked his men hard, and he wanted to make sure that they understood they were going to have to work hard. There was a sign over the door to his factory that said, Every man employed in my armory is expected to work 10 hours during the running of the engine, and no one who does not cheerfully consent to do this can be expected to be employed by me. Colt is working these people hard. But Colt was also interested in making sure his workers could sustain their efforts. He didn't want them to just work one day and succeed. He wanted them to be able to work day after day after day. He wanted 150 guns to come out of his factory every day. And the way to do that was to make sure that his workers had the support that he needed. He was one of the first people to create the hour lunchtime for his workers. And in a number of other ways, he made sure that they not only worked hard, but were supported in that work. During the American Civil War, Almost 1,000 employees produced up to 27,000 muskets and pistols a year. By 1863, the company had sold 300,000 copies of the Colt Army Revolver alone. Samuel Colt was an integral part of the Union defeating the Confederacy in the American Civil War. And the Confederacy knew it. On the morning of the 5th of February, 1864, the armory was destroyed by fire. The fire is believed to have been a work of Confederate arsonists. And all that remains of the original armory today is simply the forging shop with dozens of these uh, great big coal furnaces where steel and iron were cast into all the, all the different pieces that made up the guns. You know, pretty hard to burn down a coal furnace. But Samuel Colt did not live to see his beloved factory burn down. And the person who turned his weapons into a truly household name was not a man called Samuel. It was a woman 
called Elizabeth. Colt actually died in 1862 of complications of gout. He was only 47 years old. His wife Elizabeth took over the company from him, and amazingly, she was probably a better and more effective leader of Colt firearms than he was. Because she's living in an age where she can't vote, um, but what she manages to do is to kind of take the reins of this company all the way through to 1901, and she becomes one of the most prominent female industrialists the United States has ever seen. The most famous guns that Colt ever made came not under Samuel Colt, but under Elizabeth Colt. And it seems like Colt didn't really hit its stride until after Samuel was dead. Most of us have heard, I think, of a Colt 45. Uh, it's one of those iconic names in the firearms world. 45 refers to caliber of the barrel, chosen by the US military as big enough to reliably put down a man. It was a, what's called a single action revolver, uh, which means, as we've all seen in the Western movies, you had to cock the hammer back before you then pulled the trigger. The Americans, the cowboys, the gunfighters, anyone that needed a gun grew to love this design and the simplicity of the single action trigger. This is really Colt's legacy. And it soon attracts the marketing name of the peacemaker. Then gets described as the gun that won the West. Most people know what you're talking about when you say Colt 45. Elizabeth Colt turned the Colt 45 into an American icon and she was helped by the unique nature of the American dream. The fact that Colt's product is a firearm uh, is important for his success in the American context for two reasons. The first is the existence of, of course, the frontier, where a firearm is a necessity. The other reason, of course, is the uh, veneration of the right to bear arms as being written into the US Constitution. The fact that civilian ownership of firearms is written into the American Constitution ensures that people will be armed as they move out into the frontier, as they move into the West. And they are more often than not armed with a Colt firearm. The United States is a continental-sized country. Now, what this means is that in an area the size of Europe, there are no internal barriers. So if you have a product which catches on, it's going to sell to this enormous geographical area. Colt democratized the ownership of commercially produced firearms for a general shooting public. He not only made the guns that armed the Army and the Navy and the Marine Corps, he armed the guns that were carried by frontiersmen as they went west. These are guns carried by these really iconic figures of the Wild West, you know, Wyatt Earp, Jesse James, Wild Bill Hickok, and they're all their you know, firearms came from these factories at Coltsville. Colt's advertising even ran, God created man, Colt made them equal. And as World War loomed at the start of the 20th century, two names synonymous with the evolution of firearms would get drawn into the story of Colt. One would make the Colt 45 the most famous handgun in the world. The other would give its name to the machine gun. To win a war, it's often said you need boots on the ground. And it doesn't matter how many tanks, how many planes, how many ships you've got, if those poor bloody infantry grunts don't take that hell and hold it for you, you can't control the territory you need and you don't get the resources that you need for victory. The most basic part of an army is the individual soldier with their individual weapon occupying their individual part of ground. You can't fight war without the soldiers, and soldiers can't fight without their weapons. The kinds of guns that Colt was building was absolutely necessary to the wars that the United States fought in the 19th and the 20th century. General George Patton was famous for carrying an 1873 Colt Peacemaker in a holster on his hip whilst leading his tanks. But he wasn't the only US soldier carrying a Colt 45. So for many people, this is still the iconic Colt 45 from all of those Westerns. But there's another equally important Colt 45, and this is it. Designed in 1910, 1911 by a genius 
gun designer called John Moses Browning. It's actually the government model of 1911, designed for the military, still 45 caliber, still had that great big bullet coming out the end, but a completely different design. It was incredibly reliable, often firing thousands of rounds between malfunctions. And unlike the revolvers that the Army had used, it was actually a semi-automatic, which meant that once you fired a bullet, it automatically reloaded the next one and was ready to go. It was exactly the weapon that the Army needed. It's so reliable, it's still in use during the Korean and Vietnam Wars decades later. And people absolutely love it. I mean, even soldiers and civilians. And you can see this iconic gun in unit photos from the First World War. You know, these are men who once would have been posing with swords or rifles, and they've now got, you know, posing proudly with their Colt M1911s, you know, held across their chests. The Browning Colt 45 would arguably become the most successful handgun in the world. I mean, the numbers are huge, because by 1918, you've got over 425,000 M1911 pistols being sold. And by the end of the Second World War, that number, of course, is going to go even higher, and it goes to well over a million. But Colt wasn't just famous for its pistols. Its factory was at the forefront of another revolution in weapons design, made infamous by the First World War, the machine gun. So at the same time as you've got Browning designing this whole new breed of pistol for Colt, you've also got the Vickers Arms Manufacturing Company in Britain buying out Hiram Maxim and was converting his famous Maxim gun into the Vickers machine gun. The Vickers design for a machine gun was in fact so good that rather than create its own version of it, the United States brought the design over to America and actually handed it over to the Colt company to build. Colt eventually produces more than 12,000 Vickers guns. They initially struggled to provide enough weapons in time for America's entry into the war in 1917. And actually, in fact, there were so few operational Vickers guns in service by 1917 that you've got new recruits being forced to train with dummy wooden models rather than the real thing. Not ideal, frankly. Demand was so great that Colt expanded its factory and employed large numbers of women to help in the war effort. If you look at photographs of the Colt Hartford factory during World War I, you see large numbers of men and women building M1911 handguns and the Vickers machine gun. It's an enormous project, it's an enormous factory. During that time, you've got Hartford's industrial population growing massively from 20,000 to 30,000. And then you've got the yearly factory payroll jumping from about $14.5 million to $45 million. So it's basically trebling. But the Vickers was just the tip of the iceberg. During World War II, Colt also manufactures another firearm designed by the great John Moses Browning, a firearm called the ANM2 50 caliber machine gun. Every B-17 bomber or B-24 bomber that's in the sky is flying with a and 250 caliber machine guns. Every P-51 Mustang or F-6F Hellcat or F-4U Corsair, they're flying with a and 250 caliber machine guns. It's the true unsung hero of firearms production throughout World War II. And yet another truly revolutionary design by John Moses Browning would help carry America into a whole new era of infantry warfare. The collaboration of Colt and John Moses Browning didn't end with the 1911 pistol. They went on to produce together the Browning automatic rifle. 1917, it's the First World War, trench warfare. The Allies are trying to break through, become more dynamic. What Browning was proposing and what the army wanted was essentially an automatic rifle. So a rifle that wouldn't just fire a shot every time you pull the trigger, but would keep firing until you let go of the trigger. Big, heavy, cumbersome, but the idea was you would walk slowly towards the enemy with the gun on your hip, looking where you're aiming and firing, um, probably in short bursts, but you're fully exposed to the enemy. It's not actually the best way to use a weapon like this. And actually the tactics evolved to fit the gun. The Second World War is where this thing really shines by which time um, they've wised up a little bit, the walking fire thing is not happening, we have added 
a bipod, which is the critical piece of equipment, and a carrying handle, and that's enough to turn this into a very good light machine gun. It already has a 20 round detachable magazine. Press the button, out it comes. Fire your 20 shots, slap in 20 more, on you go. That's what you want for a light machine gun. And the troops loved it. All told, this thing is in use from the end of the First World War, from 1918, all the way through to the 1970s, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, more modern, more specialist, better weapons emerge, but this thing is a great jack of all trades. It's reliable, it's bomb proof, um, and it has a long service life. What Colt failed to realise is just what a step change their BAR had brought about. This was the first of a new era of firearms, the automatic rifle. And as Colt struggled to keep up, its star would be eclipsed by a new gun in town. Its name was Kalashnikov. In late 1941, a Soviet tank commander is recuperating in hospital when he hears some wounded soldiers complaining about their weapons. He hears them rabbiting on and they're saying that the rifles they had were old and antiquated and unreliable and there are never enough of them to go around. He felt frustrated that the Germans seemed to have better rifles that could kill more people more quickly than the Soviets did. The commander's name was Mikhail Kalashnikov, an engineer who also dabbled in weapons design. And so he set out quickly after World War II to develop a high-speed rifle. that could be mass-produced in huge quantities, and what was really crucial could be really reliable and could operate in all weathers. And what he comes up with is the AK-47. That's the story. The truth is a little more complicated, and it has to do with factories. During World War II, the Soviet military was fighting with a number of different types of firearms. Rather than have one factory producing bolt-action rifles and another factory producing pistols and yet another factory producing this version of the submachine gun, they wanted something that could do it all. They wanted to make one firearm for everyone. Their solution came from a very surprising source, the Nazis. As the war progressed in 1943 and 1944, the Red Army began to encounter an entirely new kind of weapon under development by the Germans, the Sturmgewehr, or automatic rifle. What the Germans realize, pretty much for the first time, when they invent literally the assault rifle, is that you need a rifle that's kind of dialed down a bit. And when the Soviet high command get wind of this, they go, ah, this could be the solution to our problem. So they launched a design competition. And in comes this really promising model. And it's from this young designer called Alexei Sudayev, who's developed automatic weapons for the defense of Leningrad. But unfortunately, he has a fever and dies before he can actually take this forward. So the Soviet high command passes his notes onto a design team led by one Mikhail Kalashnikov. In 1947, they introduced a prototype. Its design was quite surprising. I mean, let's face facts, the Kalashnikov is <laughs> incredibly rough and ready. It's got bits and bobs sticking out all over the place. It's not that smooth, streamlined shape of a traditional military rifle. Notably, you've got this gigantic curved bit of metal sticking out the bottom. You've got cheap-looking sheet metal all over the thing. It's no wonder, then, that when the American military got hold of a copy to evaluate, they were less than overwhelmed. They're really not impressed at all. You know, its individual parts are, are, are really quite heavy and they're fitted with really very loose tolerances. They were interested in the accuracy or lack thereof. They tested these things and they found them not accurate outside of 100 yards. But the evaluators were missing the point. Every ugly little detail is a deliberate part of the AK-47's design. 
good gun design isn't just about creating a really accurate weapon, it's about creating a weapon that is just so reliable and cost effective that you can put it into the hands of just about any soldier, no matter how much of an idiot he is, and they know how to make it work. The sites are quite close together. Again, the Americans would have looked askance at this. Sites further apart are more accurate. You can more precisely align them. Sites close together mean you can very quickly bring up the rifle, sight in your target, and pull the trigger. And the magazine is curved. Well, that's there to account for the tapered shape of the cartridges. They pass smoothly up and into the action and are then thrown out with great force when they've been fired. That was a key design feature, actually, to have 30 rounds on the weapon and not have to reload. 30 rounds is three times what military rifles were carrying at that time. In truth, the Avtomat Kalashnikova 1947, or AK-47, was the product of a long, drawn-out process involving several different designers. But the Soviets wanted a better story. So Mikhail Kalashnikov became a hero of socialist labor, and his odd-looking gun became its savior, specially designed for the unique needs of the Soviet soldier. Freezing icy, snowy conditions, muddy, wet conditions, boiling hot conditions. The Soviet Union's territory encompassed all of these at different times of the year. For an effective military weapon, you need it to, to keep running in all of those conditions. And you've got to be able to fix this thing right out in the middle of nowhere, and there are a lot of middles of nowhere in Russia, and you don't have factories for thousands of miles. This thing feels quite wobbly and loose and rattles when you move it around. It has designed in uh, loose clearances between parts. So if mud, sand, dirt gets in there, it's liable to keep functioning regardless and to just ignore it and carry on. And that was designed in from the start. Kalashnikov becomes a superlative for rugged dependability. Everywhere and always people recognize that the AK-47, it will just run and it will never fail. More importantly, this is a weapon that can be easily mass produced so that you can equip your entire army. You no longer have this soldier armed with a rifle, this soldier is armed with a carbine, this soldier is armed with a submachine gun. Everyone carries the same type of firearm. And for the Soviet Union in the aftermath of the Second World War, that firearm was Mikhail Kalashnikov's AK-47. This need for mass production led to the adoption of an unusual production technique, one pioneered a century earlier by another gun designer, Samuel Colt. The Soviets spent a decade figuring out how to use one sheet of metal where you simply just stamp or you cut a piece in the shape of a gun. You bend it under great pressure into a U-shaped box and you bolt all of the other bits you need, screw, rivet, all those bits, onto the sort of core of the gun. And of course, what this is doing is to cut down the cost of labour and raw materials so much that the average price of an AK-47 could be little more than about three to $500. I mean, that is dirt cheap. More than 100 million copies were made, spread across the military and insurgent forces of at least 106 countries. And it's a game changer. What the AK-47 as a technology does is to give an enormous boost and an advantage to insurgent forces rather than the forces which are trying to maintain the established order. I mean, it's so ubiquitous, even some countries have it on their flags. In this way, the AK became a factory for insurrection. And nowhere was the AK-47's disruptive power more obvious than in Vietnam. What you've got are these kind of local farmers, you know, not properly trained, but they're armed with this rifle that shows the Americans that their M14s are incredibly cumbersome in jungle warfare. Eventually, the US military came to the conclusion that they needed a lightweight, fully automatic rifle of their own. They were going to have to invent their own Kalashnikov. So what Colt does is to team up with Armalite to create the now iconic M16. Now, the M16 is air-cooled, it's gas-operated, it's a magazine-fed assault rifle, and of course, it's a lot more sophisticated than the AK-47. So really what we have here is a piece of precision design and engineering. It's wonderfully light, uh, beautifully made, 
latest alloys and, and polymers and all of that, great. There's only one problem. It doesn't work. The early models of the M16 were always sort of kind of clogging up and jamming in the jungle atmosphere, which is obviously really sort of fetid and sticky. And the soldiers simply saw it as a liability. The ultimate insult, um, there's a story of a gunnery sergeant walking through a camp. He's got an AK on his back and a lieutenant colonel remarks, what are you doing carrying that gunny? And his response is, because it works, sir. Soldiers were picking up Kalashnikovs because the M16 was letting them down. One can argue that one of the reasons the communists won the Vietnam War and the Americans lost was because of the more reliable Kalashnikov. Eventually, Colt managed to fix the issues with their gun. Once those problems were resolved after 1968, they went away forever, and the M16 is a completely reliable weapon system. In fact, it's one of the most reliable weapon systems out there. But there is another reason why the AK-47 was so popular. Since it wasn't patented, you didn't have to pay for a license to make one. And that was very deliberate. From soldiers guarding the Berlin Wall and preventing East Germans from escaping, to people in Africa fighting for their independence from colonial powers, to countries in the Middle East, this is sort of the long arm of communism. But as the Cold War played out across the world, the inventors of the AK-47 would discover they had unleashed a Frankenstein's monster. The massive risk, of course, in proliferating your own weapon around the world is that the people you give them to might not necessarily agree with your outlook on things. Soon the guns were being used by guerrilla groups against the very governments that produced them. So we see in countless places, but um, notably in Afghanistan, those same Kalashnikovs that are provided to local fighters get turned on the Soviet troops when they come in in the late 70s. Mexican drug cartels or a more established group at this point, ISIS, they're all relying on AK-47s. So this Soviet invention is with us to this day. The AK is estimated to have caused an enormous amount of deaths. And in fact, it's often said that it's actually meant to have caused more deaths than artillery fire, airstrikes and rocket attacks combined. Now, you know, some people think that actually probably about a quarter of a million people a year are gunned down by bullets that have come out of Kalashnikovs. One could argue that the factory that developed the Kalashnikov is one of the most successful ones of all time. It may not be a happy sign of success, but it certainly has proved um, the durability of the Kalashnikov. Colt and Kalashnikov, two names synonymous with death. One democratized gun ownership, the other democratized resistance. Both have changed the way the world works. On the 5th of December, 1916, workers in a factory on the outskirts of Leeds began their night shift. Minutes later, a deafening explosion shattered the night. A massive explosion took out an entire machine. You have lots of bits of concrete falling out the sky. Fire, fumes, smoke, horrendous. Dozens lost their lives and many more lay injured. Some of them were only able to be identified by the identity tags that they wore. Not a word of this would reach the outside world. The victims were never acknowledged. It was all hushed up. No account of the incident was made in the national news. But the people who lost their lives knew the risks that they were taking. This was total war. This was a war beyond their imagining. Far from the trenches and craters of no man's land raged an unseen war that broke tradition, risked lives, and rebuilt a nation. You had to turn all of Britain into one giant factory. A war that saw millions answer the call. If they'd not been there, we would not have won the war.
August 1914. Britain, along with France and Russia, had declared war on Germany and its Austro-Hungarian allies. The British Expeditionary Force was mobilized and departed for the front. We actually send overseas seven divisions. It's about 150,000 soldiers. It quickly became apparent that this was a war like no other. Much to the shock of all the nations fighting in the First World War, the war they were fighting was a completely different one than they expected. Everybody had planned for a moving type of warfare and a mobile warfare. But what happens when the war begins is that goes completely out of the window. Gone were the old tactics, the cut and thrust of previous military engagements. Now every inch of land was hard fought and bitterly held. What they found was a war in which they were digging into the ground and creating giant trench systems with millions of soldiers staring at each other over what aptly came to be known as no man's land. Soon a system of defenses grew to encompass the whole of the Western Front. 440 miles of trenches, dugouts and barbed wire that stretched all the way from the Swiss border to the North Sea. You can't go forward or push the enemy back, so they begin to dig in their positions to hold as best they can. Once you move into that war of attrition, the trench warfare, the way you prepare for the attack and then hold the enemy off if they counterattack is by use of artillery. As the war ground to a standstill, vast fortifications were constructed on both sides. Soon, the only hope that any military operation had of success was to pound these positions into the mud. What becomes clear to the authorities is that in order to give your men the best chance, you really need to support them with as much artillery as you can muster, which is when you get barrages come in prior to them going over the top. You want the artillery to pound the living daylights out of the enemy before your men attack on foot. This moment became known by historians as the Guns of August. The government of Prime Minister Herbert Henry Asquith was woefully unprepared for this new type of warfare, which was, at the time, the complete opposite of British military doctrine. The main British force that went over to France to, to start fighting World War I was the British Expeditionary Force. And they were actually a, primarily an infantry force. That meant they relied on their rifles, their accurate shooting, and their individual soldiers to, to fight battles. They only had 29 million artillery shells stored and ready to go. And while that sounds like a lot, that actually was only about four big battles by the British government's reckoning. And the feeling is that the war will be over by that point anyway. When that doesn't happen, Britain has begun a war which really, it's not a position to finish. By the end of 1914, only 5% of the 10 million shells ordered for the British army had actually been delivered. Shell stores soon ran dangerously low, and Britain's war factories struggled to keep up. Before the First World War started, Britain had a fairly limited ability to produce munitions. They had a small army, they had enough production capacity to equip that army, but they didn't have a lot of ability to expand that production quickly. But also as well, you have to remember that Britain's had a liberal government several years before the war, and liberal government didn't like spending money on war. So traditionally, the army shrinks, armament shrinks, the budgets go down. This lack of preparedness for modern warfare was badly exposed when British High Command ordered a major offensive at the front. The British Army had planned and mounted attack at a place called Aubers Ridge in France on 9th May 1915. The offensive was intended to exploit Germany's diversion of troops to the Eastern Front. British artillery, numbering over 500 guns, was charged with knocking out German defences before the big push. But the lack of munitions meant shelling could only last a mere 40 minutes. Tens of thousands of shells are, are made available, but actually the number of shells is inadequate. Some of the guns are rationed to 10 shells a day when they need 10 a minute, and soldiers in trenches can survive particularly a weak barrage. Then you advance, and all the enemy does is catch your soldiers in the open with their own returning artillery fire. The attack lasted only a day, 
but resulted in over 11,000 British casualties, the vast majority falling within yards of their own front lines. It had been a catastrophic disaster. The commander of the British Army, Sir John French, complained about that to the correspondent of the London Times, who was actually over uh, with the British Expeditionary Force in France. On the 14th of May, 1913, the London Times led with a devastating headline. The public and parliament were outraged at the idea that the British soldiers didn't have the equipment they needed, and they demanded answers. It nearly destroys us with government. It does destroy the Liberal government in that he has to form a coalition going forward. But the coalition would only last if it could deliver enough shells to the front to make a difference. So what Asquith did was turn to one of the youngest and most aggressive of the Liberal politicians in the cabinet, David Lloyd George. Lloyd George was the Chancellor of the Exchequer and had gained a reputation as an apt politician, earning him the nickname the Welsh Wizard. Lloyd George Asquith thought had the kind of aggressiveness and intelligence that could turn this situation around. The Asquith government passed the 1915 Munitions of War Act and created the Ministry of Munitions. David Lloyd George was appointed its first minister. He was now in charge of all the munitions production in Britain. The coalition and the nation could only survive if the shell crisis could be fixed. His task was monumental. The stockpiles in the UK are getting absolutely diminished. There was a desperate scramble to start creating more production, more munitions and more factories that would create the weapons they needed to fight the war. To do this, Lloyd George not only had to remake an industry, but revolutionise an entire society. All the while, on the front lines, the guns of August kept firing. On the 9th of June, 1915, David Lloyd George took charge of the newly formed Ministry of Munitions. His mission was to solve Britain's shell crisis and keep the guns firing. We have insufficient shells of the correct calibre. Many of them are shrapnel shells, which are very good against men in the open, but if the enemy are behind a trench or in a dugout, well, to be honest, you might as well spit at them. As trench warfare took hold, Germany poured in resources to secure its early advances. The German positions are so strong and so effective. I mean, they're in concrete bunkers dozens of feet underground, so you're going to have artillery blasting them off the face of the earth. Shrapnel shells couldn't pry the enemy from their dug-in positions. British forces now had to rely on high-caliber, high-quality artillery shells to blast them out. And very, very importantly, a lot of those shells simply don't function because they've been produced by factories at the outbreak of war were producing kitchen sinks or toys. They are not really prepared for the job. Lloyd George's task was made even more difficult by Britain's lack of industrial mobilisation. The problem with Asquith's government was they felt it was not really their role to intervene in the running of companies. So they left it to the individual companies to improve their ability to produce shells as they saw fit. The result of this lack of direction is that by the spring of 1915, only 50% of the small calibre artillery shells that had been ordered had been delivered and of anything above really the six inch shell, about a third was actually produced and available. It was a catastrophe. At the time, Britain's munitions industry only had three dedicated state-controlled war factories to supply its armed forces. There is a gunpowder factory at Waltham Abbey. There's a small arms factory at Enfield Lock, but the overwhelming amount of work is done at Woolwich Arsenal, and that has been Britain's premier site for artillery and munitions and armaments since the 17th century. These war factories were supplemented by a range of private ventures, but as the war progressed, 
Demand quickly outstripped supply. The government needed to ramp up to millions of shells rather than thousands of shells. Factories in the country just couldn't keep up with the amount of munitions that they were being asked to produce. They didn't have enough staff, they didn't have the facilities. You've got to remember it was the first fully industrialised war. If Lloyd George in the Ministry of Munitions was to succeed, he had to move quickly. Lloyd George ran his ministry with a mixture of cunning and head-breaking. The first thing he did was to call in all of the factory owners, all of the industrial producers, and start getting them to work figuring out how to improve munitions production. If they didn't want to cooperate, he threatened them with serious consequences. But he also schmoozed them and made them want to cooperate. And through this combination of good cop, bad cop, he managed to get most of those factory owners on his side and on the side of the British war effort. But the factory owners were the least of Lloyd George's problems. By 1915, Germany's advance into France had been checked but at a terrible cost. The original expeditionary force had been virtually wiped out, suffering a monstrous 90,000 casualties. What remained was divided into two new armies, both in desperate need of fresh recruits. From 1914 to at least 1916, when you get conscription, the loss of male labor was Massive. A lot of the skilled mechanics and producers who they needed in the factories were actually already on the front lines fighting that war. So the only way to really replace that was to bring women in to do these roles. Before the Great War, a woman's role was in the home. Jobs in society were mostly the preserve of men, and any woman in full employment was considered to be neglecting her domestic responsibilities. The employment of women in factories is an issue at the beginning of the war with trade unions. Then it's another thing that needs to be negotiated because as well as restricting people on bringing in a less skilled person to do their job, there's also restrictions on bringing in a woman to do their job. Trade unions had been dragging their feet about putting women into factories. If women could do it, then it wasn't a skilled job. Therefore, the wages didn't need to be as high. Therefore, men returning at the end of the war wouldn't need to be paid as much. It would have devalued the whole system. Factory owners also believed women weren't ready to join the workforce. In 1915, the government created the initiative of the Women's War Register to see who would be willing to work in industry and nursing and things like that. And a month later, 79,000 women had signed up and said, we will work in industry. And this was something that Lloyd George championed because he knew that they had to have these schemes to show that women were willing to work, to kind of force the rest of the government to come in line and get these women into the factories. It was a gamble, but it paid off. Yes, there was chaos. Uh, yes, it was disorganised. It's very much like everything in this war. It's off the cuff, it's learning on the go and uh, evolving on the move. But to be fair to Lloyd George, yes, he did create a more smooth running and upscaled manufacturing process in Britain to get the munitions made. New practices and techniques also boosted Britain's war factory production. So what you have in the First World War is the advent of the assembly line. This allows a number of relatively unskilled people to carry out a process in a repetitive way, producing a linear production line, giving you results at the end. This breakdown of skilled to semi-skilled labour was known as dilution. Dilution is necessary because before the war, maybe it was OK to have one highly skilled guy that could do a whole process that would take an entire day to achieve one bit of output. If you suddenly need 50 times that output, are you going to find 50 of these guys? No. So what you do is you go and recruit a load of minions and you bring them in and you put them in a line. And instead of the one guy doing everything to the end of the line, he teaches each minion to do a little part of the process. So that means that you can multiply your production capacity massively without finding huge amounts of people that are as skilled as that one man who used to do the job all the way through. The key thing is you don't need a, a small, tiny team of highly skilled people. You need lots of semi-skilled labour. 
Trade unions were far from happy with the idea of women taking men's work for lesser pay. Lloyd George knew all too well what these grievances could spell. Lloyd George had to worry about the people who were going to work on those assembly lines. And, and most important from his perspective was he had to stop the kind of strikes and general worker unrest that had so marked the British economy before 1914. The Defense of the Realm Act and, and other powers that Parliament gave him actually gave him the ability to legally forbid workers from going on strike and generally to take control of the workforce in the way that he thought most effective to build the munitions that the British needed. Still, to keep the unions on side, an agreement had to be reached. Women could only be trained to a semi-skilled level and must work under supervision. Lloyd George now had his labor force, but to get the factories he needed, he adopted a two-pronged approach. Some of it relied on private industry, on the factories that already existed that were owned by heads of industry and could produce more than they were. But some of it also relied on increasing government production. And, and in this area, he started what was called the National Factory Scheme, where the government actually started building its own factories to produce munitions of all sorts. The National Factories are a completely new innovation. This is government basically directing industry in a way that, that's never been seen before. Nothing like this has been attempted because what it's doing is basically making the needs of production subordinate to the needs of the state. A lot of Lloyd George's tactics were kind of harsh, but one of the things you have to keep in mind is that every day new casualty reports were coming home from the Western Front. Every day, Lloyd George was being reminded of how many thousands of British soldiers were being wounded and killed. And that drove him to make sure that they had the kind of equipment that they needed to fight the war. A total of 170 factories were established throughout England. One of the brand new purpose-built factories was at Barnbow, just outside of Leeds. It would go on to become one of the most productive shell factories in the whole of Britain. As the war in Europe escalated, Britain's stockpiles of ammunition were drastically reduced. Lloyd George and his recently formed Ministry of Munitions had to keep the country in the fight and fix its production shortfall. Near Leeds, one of the new generation of war factories was constructed. Barbo was a purpose-built factory and it was part of the network of shell factories that came about as a result of the, the shell crisis. The national filling factories were a particularly specialized kind of factory. They were responsible for essentially everything to do with making the explosive shell actually explosive. Built on a 400 acre site, the giant war factory had its own railway system, complete with an 800 foot long platform that allowed swift access to and from the site. The railway line came right into the heart of the factory and it also went all the way around the factory as well. They would offload all the goods into the centre of the site and they would be distributed to the different sections of the factory. Railways were critical for the national factories and Barnbo had its own 13-mile line that connected it to the national rail network. The national factories relied on a steady and immediate supply of raw materials. If the iron and steel didn't come in, the factories couldn't produce what they needed. And the only way to get what they needed into those national factories was through the railway. There's no suggestion in the Great War of putting ammunition on lorries, taking it to a railway station and loading it again. You take it straight from the workshop, put it straight on the train, and off it goes. Down to the coast so that it can be put on a boat and sailed to France. Along with the shell filling works and cartridge stores, Barnbow also housed a tinsmith for renovating cartridge cylinders, a workshop that converted empty propellant boxes into packing cases, a laundry, a garage, and it even had its own fire brigade. Barnbow wasn't just a factory on its own. It's like a city within a city. But the threat of war was never far away, and the Royal Defence Corps ran around the clock security. 
with workers made to wear IDs and carry permits. Ninety-three percent of the workforce were women, and 130,000 women actually applied to work at Barnwell. They took on about 20,000, 19, 20,000. Fifty of them went down to Woolwich Arsenal to be trained, and they came back and disseminated the training to, to the other people. Within months, Barnbow was producing 50,000 shells a week, and each shell had one single purpose. Munitions factories in the Great War produce a range of projectiles, and this is just one of them. This is the standard British 4.5-inch howitzer shell. It's called 4.5-inch because that's the diameter of the shell. And what we've got here is the main body, factory filled with explosives. But to actually get it to go through the air, to fire it, you need to have the shell case pre-prepared with charges. We've actually got a little percussion cap which is struck by a firing pin. That will cause our cordite to burn, explode in the weapon, forcing the propellant to actually push this projectile up the barrel. It will then fly through the air to whatever range you've already designed it to go, but when it strikes the ground, then the fuse at this end is crushed, and the crushing action causes the detonation of the main body of the shell. In detonating, it then causes all the explosives inside our projectile to themselves detonate causing the casing to break into fragments, hundreds if not thousands of red-hot, jagged pieces of steel. Shells were assembled 24 hours a day in a three-shift system. The demands of war meant no let-up for Barnbow workers. Working hours were extremely long, on average eight-hour shifts, 12-hour shifts on a Sunday, just doing the same repetitive work over and over, day in, day out. There were no holidays because these women were crucial to the war effort. Every hour was dedicated to shell production. You can't leave your machine without permission. If you're late in the morning, the machine is disabled and you get no money at all for that shift. So you have to be on time, do what you need to do. And frankly, you know, if you need to go to the loo, you've got to time it pretty damn carefully. Full employment was ensured by high wages far above average women's rates. The basic pay was 28 shilling a week, but they could earn up to three pound on bonus. These working class women were now able to act like upper class women. They were able to buy fur coats. Having money to spend on taxes, having money to lend. For once, they were the ones supporting their families and they were the ones with this spending power that they would have never had before. That spending power gave them a new freedom but such behaviour was often frowned upon. They enjoyed a lifestyle that they could simply never have thought of having. These working class munitionettes were definitely kind of acting out of their normal behaviour. There are anecdotally stories about how boisterous the girls were. It was said that if a lone man got into a carriage full of bamboo girls, he did so at his own peril. And certainly there's a story of a man who was going to York and um, by the time he arrived at York, he had been debugged. This newfound autonomy was sometimes ridiculed in the press. In newspapers, there was a massive sense that uh, munitions workers were acting above their station. Quite a lot of the time, they discuss munitions workers in quite derogatory ways. But good wages weren't the only reason these women took up roles in Britain's war factories. They also felt that they could help support their men folk who were fighting at the front line. There was a, a great sense of patriotism. These women, they were not there solely for the money. They wanted to win the war and they wanted to do everything that they could in order to do that. Along with high earnings, a number of innovations were also incorporated into the factory's design. You want these workers to spend nigh on every waking hour at this factory that to some extent they have to want to be there. There were three canteens. They had a medical department, a dentist. They provided leisure facilities. The management were certainly very conscious that they had to look after their workforce. Soldiers were expendable. 
unfortunately. But these women were not so expendable because without the shells that they were producing, we would just would not have won the war. Not far from the main shell factory, a separate factory was also constructed. Its production was top secret. One of the innovations that the national factories created was a new kind of shell filling. They actually started using something called amatol, which was a mixture of ammonium nitrate and TNT to fill the shells that they were producing there. It was much more efficient, it was much more stable than what they had done previously. It's usually in an 80-20% ratio. Obviously, at the Bambo factory, they were kind of experimenting to see what would make it more efficient and effective. The Amatol section was entirely separate to the rest of the factory. And it was also protected by barbed wire and guards because the two sets of employees were not allowed to mix. They had ladies in red dresses outside the doors of the canteen who prevented anyone who wasn't an Amatol worker going in. This was because of the cross-contamination from chemicals that they were working with. These workers handled deadly toxins, and for some, the effects were immediately visible. When you worked with Amatol, when you worked with the explosives, a fair amount of it migrated under your skin and turned you a quite an impressively bright yellow color. This earned them the nickname, the Canary Girls. The bright yellow skin is actually not really a joke. It had serious health consequences and it gives you a form of jaundice. It, it probably kills over 100 women. Others are very, very sick as a result of it. One canary girl later said, You expected to feel poorly. Our skin was perfectly yellow, right down through the body, legs and toenails even. The Ministry of Munitions realized these health problems and they fairly quickly introduced sets of protective clothing for the factory workers to wear. And that worked to reduce some of the health consequences. The need to improve health led to one surprising addition at Barnbo, its own farm. Housing 120 cows, producing 300 gallons of milk per day, it was a vital resource. The girls were involved in running the farm, producing produce for the canteen and the milk, because they were encouraged to drink the milk to counter -effect the effects of the TNT poisoning. The farm also produced fresh vegetables and meat with its own on-site slaughterhouse and butcher. The girls were fed extremely well, certainly did far better than the average woman in the street, uh, because uh, they had a lot of things on hand. The well-being of Barnbo employees was important, but in a factory full of explosives, danger was never far. The problem with mass producing explosives is if you run the assembly line 24 seven, that means that at any one time, you have enormous amount of extremely dangerous material in the factory. You can only limit that danger as much as you can. There is always going to be some risk involved. The ministry and Great Britain were winning the arms race, but this success did not come without sacrifice. In the first few months of the war, shell production was a mere 500,000 artillery rounds. By 1916, that figure had risen to a staggering 16.4 million. It was clear that war factories like Barnbo had played a major role in turning around Britain's fortunes. After 1915 and going into 1916, Britain had overcome to a large extent the problem of not producing enough shells. This rush to remake and rearm didn't just cost lives in battle, but also in war factories at home. There are some catastrophic accidents during the First World War. Probably the one that springs to mind for me is Silvertown, which is over in the Docklands area. It was a classic example of what goes wrong when you're trying to purify TNT in the middle of London. There was an explosion which killed workers on site. The explosion claimed 73 lives including many children, and injured over 400. But it also had a catastrophic effect on the local community. What happens at Silvertown is the explosive had to be got into the shells, and that job was done manually. But because of problems with melting the explosive, you have that risk that if you get it wrong, if there is a spark, then it would explode. 
everybody's windows for a certain radius were blown out. You could feel it all the way into Essex. So, and, and what it did, the king went to see the site as soon as he got back from Sandringham, and he said, it's like a little bit of the Western Front in East London. The Ministry of Munitions tried to reduce these risks, and Barnbow was built with a number of special safety measures. They built, rather than one assembly line, a range of huts widely separated from each other. In each of these huts, some of the shell production would happen. Because of the separation, if one of the huts blew up and there was a lot of damage, it wouldn't extend to all of the rest of the huts. That didn't protect someone inside from getting blown up. That just meant if that person got blown up, the bits of them and the bits of the wooden hut they were working in would be contained. So the factory could keep going with production even if there was an industrial accident. Practices like these were the forerunner to modern health and safety. War changes the nature of industry in many ways. It brings in a series of acts which to do with health and safety, which means that actually it's safer to be in a factory at the end of the First World War than at the beginning of the First World War, purely because during the course of the war, we can't afford to lose labor and people and machines to accidents. Sadly, precautions could only do so much, and the threat of tragedy haunted every working moment. Inherently, producing munitions and dealing with explosives and shells and fuses and all types of paraphernalia involved with destroying things is going to be dangerous. If anything goes wrong, then it's going to be really a very, very bad situation in the factory. For Barnbo, it was only a matter of time before risk became reality. Sadly, on the 5th of December 1916, there was an explosion at the factory in Hump 42. What happened was an operator had six shells. She'd put fuses into two of them and tightened them up. She put the third one on and it exploded. This set off a chain reaction and detonated five other shells. The ceiling came down. There were fumes, there was smoke. It must have been horrendous. The entire room was devastated. There was between 170 and 175 operators working in that room. Some people were absolutely blown apart. Others were very, very seriously injured. And we've heard stories of people running away screaming. It was absolutely complete what was the devastation. In the mayhem that followed, one passing worker dared enter the ruined hut. A mechanic was walking by called William Parkin. Rather than run away from the incident, he actually ran towards it and he entered the hut at least 11 times. And he came out each time with an injured girl on his shoulder. I think if William hadn't have done what he did, more people would have died. He saved at least 11 lives that night. Sadly, 35 women perished from the accident. Some of them were only able to be identified by the identity tags that they wore. It was the first major loss of women civilian workers in the war, and a heartbreaking loss for Barnbow. Local historians recount one story of a young employee who, like so many underage soldiers, had lied about their age to sign up. Edith Sykes was only 15 years of age at the time. She shouldn't have been in the factory that night. She worked with her sister, her elder sister, Agnes. Agnes had the flu at the time. And Agnes should have been working, but Edith took her place. And as a result, she was caught in the explosion. She didn't die on the night, but she did die two or three weeks later. There was a lady from York. She was killed. Her husband walked the 20 miles from York to identify her body. And then they gave him a cup of tea and a bun and sent him on his way back to his family and she left 10 children. Losing 35 people, it was tragic for a lot of the people that happened, and some people did never return to the site after that night. But in the grand scheme of things, much more was happening on the Western Front. The war was far from over, so Barnbow had to continue. Its production was just too vital. They cleared out the factory, and the room was immediately put back together. 
and the management asked for volunteers to go back and work in there and they were inundated with volunteers. Within 24 hours, Hut 42 was fully staffed and back in operation once more. People were straight back into work because they knew that they had a job to do. When explosions happened, it was kind of just collateral damage to the bigger picture of the war effort. There's just this spirit of, this is our war. These girls can't put on a uniform and hold a rifle in the trenches. That's what their brothers are doing, their fathers are doing, their boyfriends, their husbands, their sons. This is what they can do, and their commitment to this cause is therefore absolute. Due to the secret nature of Barnbow's production, the outside world received little notice of the incident. The victims of the explosion were never, ever really acknowledged. It was all hushed up, completely hushed up. The only clues to the tragedy were a short article that appeared in the local paper, which did not name Barnbow, and the death notices posted the following days, with cause of death given as accident or suddenly. They didn't want news to get through to the front, to the boys at the front. They didn't want to put people off from coming to work in the munitions factories. Workers at the Barnbo plant had their own ideas about what happened in Hut 42. My grandmother worked in the factory at Barnbo and her job was to put the fuse onto the 4.5 inch howitzer shell that we have here. Um, delicate job because you've got to locate the casing with a pin built into the machine and then the rotating element of the machine puts another pin in this and then rotates the whole thing down. Bearing in mind at this point that we've now got a shell full of high explosive with a cap going onto it, a fuse which if it goes off will set the whole lot off. On the day of the accident in December 1916, my grandmother was meant to start work at 10 p.m. She wasn't feeling well, so she wasn't going to go to work. She was going to stay at home. So someone else was operating her machine, which caused the explosion. My grandmother always said that the woman that replaced her was known to be clumsy. She was often told off for over-tightening the fuse. So the explosion was caused by the woman operating my grandma's machine, who over-tightened one of these fuses. However, despite the personal opinion of Andy's grandmother, the official inquiry found a faulty fuse was to blame. This accident was horrendous, but it wasn't the only one. It was happening in other parts of the country. Other lives were being lost. But if you're in the middle of a war, you have to carry on. He couldn't not provide the shells to the boys at the front. By the end of the war, Barnbow was one of Britain's premier war factories. Its workers had filled nearly 25 million shells, almost 15% of the total shells fired during the war by the British forces. I think the people who worked there were all extremely proud of what they'd done and very conscious of how much part of the war effort that they had been. After the armistice, many who helped Britain to victory soon found themselves unwanted. After the war, everything went back to normal. Women went back to their usual roles and they were kind of pushed out, don't talk about what happened. All these women who'd given their all were discarded. There was nothing for them, there was no provision made for them to go to work anywhere else. Understandably, the men were coming back from the front and they had to go back to their jobs. All they got was a little certificate, the size of a postcard, which said, this person worked at Bambo during the war. And that was it. Women workers saw their opportunities decline, and by 1919, over 600,000 women were registered unemployed. But the war years had left their mark on those who answered Lloyd George's call. I think it definitely changes women's opinions of themselves. However, I don't think that in many ways you can say that it fully liberated women because a lot of women didn't get the right to vote until 10 years after the end of the war. But I definitely think that it kind of pushed for a step in the right direction to actually say women can do the same things as men and they'll do it just as well. The legacy of the Barnbow workers and all munitions workers 
was the remarkable change in Britain's fortunes during World War I. The ability of the British to create these war factories quickly, to, to remake their entire economy, to rebuild their munition production from the ground up, was perhaps the central reason why the British won the First World War. They equipped not only their army, but the American army with munitions, with machine guns, with artillery, and with shells. And that underpinned all of the fighting that defeated Germany. I think because the decisions taken in 1915, that model paves the way for what we see, particularly after the Second World War, in a way that you don't see in other nations. Britain makes a bold decision that victory will depend upon the means of production. And if that means central government taking control, that's the way it is.